My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week, if you've watched Netflix at all in the past year, you've seen this show, Narcos. But tonight, we have the real guy. Steve Murphy's going to be joining us. He was part of the multinational high-profile investigation of its time. He worked with the Colombian Task Force with his partner and were responsible for the downfall and capture of the world's first narco-terrorist, the infamous drug cartel leader Pablo Escobar. He lived with bounties on his head. He came from small-town law enforcement to one of the biggest names in law enforcement. Tonight in the studio, Steve Murphy. How you doing, sir? DJ, man, I'm, I'm doing great, and it's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm so glad. So I want to get right into what we talk about on here, and and it's going to be the cases, you know, how how important the cases that you took part of, not only when you were over in Columbia, but but throughout your career. Um, you've, you've tackled a bunch of assignments. You've moved around. I, I want to know, though, in the very beginning – you talk in your book about um, being a kid and being camping with your friends. And then at night after everyone would go to sleep, you would ride around. So one night the cops catch you and you really are kind of enamored by this police officer with the way he treated you, the professionalism that he had. And I felt like in the book that kind of gave you your start towards this. Am I, am I correct in that? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, and honestly, I didn't really realize that until, you know, we've done some of these interviews and, and I put the story in the book just because I think that's why I've always wanted to be a cop. <clears throat> I've never wanted to do anything else, to be honest with you. And then had a 38 year career. So, um, uh, but I mean, you know, I was 10 or 11 years old and, and I guess that those two cops just really, I don't know that I was smart enough to realize they were using common sense, you know, and, and using officer discretion at the time, which I don't think you're allowed to do anymore. Well, um, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I, I've heard that you and your partner, Javier, like to give your own opinions on not only the case that we're going to talk about tonight or a couple of the cases that we're going to talk about, but law enforcement in general. And you mm -hmm. kind of hit the nail on the head right there when you talked about that, that the common sense really can't be used anymore. Uh, we're right on the uh, precipice of another trial that's getting ready to end probably within the week. And that's the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Um, mm -hmm. There there's already, you know, being talk of riots and things like that, no matter what the judgments are. So I, I want to kind of get your ideas and your thoughts on the difference between when you started, when you were around the kind of things that you guys did and what you see it as now, because you still are in the law enforcement community. Well, and thank you for saying that. Cause, um, you know, the biggest thing I miss about not being a cop is the camaraderie. Uh, you certainly don't miss the BS paperwork and all the, you know, the bureaucracy and all that junk that goes along with it. Um, <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, first of all, I love the saying common sense isn't common. <laughs> And it's true. We, we say but it a lot It seems now. like in the, in the law enforcement culture, there's a lot of common sense, you know, and, and when I first started as a police officer in 1975, I was in the big metropolis of Bluefield, West Virginia. We had 35 police officers back then. Um, and, and this is just one case in particular. And I hadn't been a cop. I hadn't even been a cop a year. I think I was still at uh, West Virginia State Police Academy. I'd come home on the weekends. And there was another new police officer, my best friend, Jackie Walters. And we had a guy who was a friend, but he's also kind of a quasi informant. And he called us on a Saturday night and he says, Hey, is, there's a kid here who wants to smell a pound of weed. Well, you know, in 1975 in Southern West Virginia, a pound of weed, that was a lot of dope. <laughs> so uh, we just set up a, a little meeting there in the back of a gas station that was open for business actually. And, and the 17 year old kid shows up, has a pound of weed. It wasn't us jumping out like they do on TV. We just stepped out of a back room and said, hey, how you, how you doing? What you got there? And we took his <laughs> weed and we did a little field test and it tested positive. And so we took him up to the police station. 
Now he is scared to death, you know, and his dad shows up and when his dad showed up, I knew why. Cause it reminded me of my dad when I was 10 years old and the cops took me home. Right. So, uh, we didn't charge that kid. And about two years ago, uh, I was never on social media till we started our, our DEA narcos business and our speaking and, you know, website and all that stuff. And now we do it for marketing purposes. And, and I'll be honest with you, as soon as we stop working, that will all go away. Cause it's just a Royal pain in the butt. <laughs> I mean, we can, I'm sure you get hate mail too, but it's some of the stuff that people send us. I'm like, you even made me blush when I read what you just wrote there. You know, yeah. I mean, it's really nasty. A lot of it. So uh, a couple of years ago I was on Facebook and, and I ran across somebody I knew in West Virginia and this guy, this kid, you know, back in 1975, who's now a grown man had sent a message to somebody and I saw it. He says, I'm telling you, this is the guy that arrested me when I was a kid. So I sent him a, a message and on, was it messenger? I think. And I just said, Hey, are, is that you? And he's like, man, I, I owe you my life. He said, you know, just because of your, your uh, being so gracious and, you know, not taking a, knocking a kid down for the rest of his life. He said, you know, I've become a successful businessman. And if it wasn't for you, he said, you know, my, my bad, my dad almost beat me to death. I knew that was going to happen. And I was grounded for like 18 years, but you know, not quite that long, but he said, uh, I just can't thank you enough. And I thought after all these years for somebody to say something like that, it just shows you that an officer's discretion is based on common sense. It's not doing favors for certain people. It's just looking at the, to the totality of the situation and what's to be gained. If I had put that 17 year old kid in jail, you know, so just, and, I, and I'm, I, I know I'm sounding like I'm bragging. I'm just, I'm impressed that something like that happened. And I was, you know, for that one second there, I had enough common sense not to put the kid in jail. Well, but you, you bring up a point. I mean, a pound of weed back in 1975, like you said, in West Virginia is a lot of dope. I mean, you definitely could have got some time for this kid. And, and you realize that he's stupid, you know, just being a kid. Mm -hmm. And I, I think another one of the problems, and, and I'll see if you agree with me, is that we can't say stuff like that anymore. Like you're a stupid kid. Like, and just right. tell them you're a stupid kid and let's move on from this. It, it has to be, you know, like you said, with the hate mail and everything else, when you're just trying to, no one's looking, they can't see the forest for the trees because mm -hmm. all they're trying to do is pay attention to what is bad in the situation, not what came good out of the situation. And, right. and you know, you turn that guy's life around and, and when you think about it, that's a pound of weed. And then you move to what you did in the DEA and you, you see the difference. Now, my question to you though, is, is that how did you as a police officer and, and a special agent, how do you decide the difference between someone that's being stupid and just making some mistakes in life and a real shithead? Well, they usually show their true colors. <laughs> I mean, think about it when you, you know, when you, I worked uniform for years and you know, you got to work traffic and right. how many people did you pull over that talked themselves into a ticket? Yeah. Right. I mean, I gave out lots more warning tickets than I ever did, you know, legit tickets. And, and, you know, even if the, if the city was counting stats, you still got a scratch for a stat for writing a warning ticket. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, but there's some people that just won't let you be nice. I'd walk up to every car I walked up to, I'd say, how you doing tonight? And the first thing almost everybody would say is, I'm not doing nothing. <laughs> oh, I didn't ask you what you're doing. I asked how you're doing. <laughs> but, you know, and, and then a lot of times that would break the ice and they'd start giggling a little bit. And, and uh, you know, you're not out there to be a terrorist as a police officer. You, you're a public servant, which to me is a badge of honor. You know, the fact that, that you and I <clears throat> and all our other brothers and sisters in the law enforcement culture have chosen to serve our fellow man, I wear that as a badge of honor. Uh, a lot of people look at it as a derogatory term, you know, rich people like, Oh yeah, I'm going to wipe my feet on you. Well, who are you going to call when you got a problem? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love being a cop and, and, uh, what it's led to later in life. Never thought we'd be doing this. Never thought I'd get to talk to you, DJ. So it's well, just amazing how the good Lord works things out. I, I am glad that he did. Uh, Here's the question that I have, and that, that's great that you bring that up, because in the book, once again, and we're going to go back and forth to the book a lot, but you talk about trouble that you had as a young officer, and when you just mentioned, like, rich people wiping their feet, you had a little bit of trouble with stuff like that as as a young officer, and you you really saw 
I wouldn't even say the the dark side of law enforcement. You saw the dark side of the justice system and how those wheels turn sometimes. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because I think it covers kind of everything that is involved in being a police officer. You had the crusty old guy that was with you that, that just wanted to, to do the job. You have the defense attorney. You have the judges. You have a, a, a person of stature that knows people. So if you can, will you, will you talk about that story with me? Sure, sure. It was, you know, I, I mean, I was still riding with a partner, a senior partner. Um, I, he's letting me drive finally. And uh, we're driving down a residential street and this car coming the other direction runs me off the road up on the sidewalk and then sideswipes the car behind me, a civilian, and keeps on going. So I whip around and we pull the car over and, and uh, it's an older lady and she is just schnockered. I mean, she can't hardly get out of the car without falling down. Dressed very nice and, and I don't know if it was a Cadillac or I don't think it was a Mercedes or anything. I think it was an American made car, but it's a really nice car. So we, you know, gave her field sobriety, which she horribly failed <laughs> took her up to the police station when we got there um uh, tom mustard who's passed away now god rest his soul um he was he was a crusty old fart man and uh, he looked at me he says kid you're gonna take care of this one and he walked off and got in the cruiser and left so not knowing you know, he knew she who she was turns out she was well here was the first clue that something was going wrong is because we were on this was like 12 30 1 o'clock in the morning and the chief came out. The chief never comes out yeah. in the middle of the night unless there's somebody been shot or something like that. And I'm right. like, oh, this is kind of strange. And uh, so, so long story short, she is the sister-in-law of a district court judge in our county. And her husband is one of the major partners in one of the biggest law firms in Southern West Virginia. Uh, they did a lot of criminal work, but they also did, they made their money off civil stuff. So, um, you know, we, I mean, she blew, or she were, I think she refused the breathalyzer or did she blow, blow 0.20? I don't know that I, I did a lot of DUIs. I, I want to say she blew a 0.2 <laughs> anyway. And back then, you know, it was 0.1 was uh, 0.10 was, was a lot higher than what it is now. And the next thing you know, I was going to take her up in the lockup and the death sergeant's like, uh, and the chief's like, no, 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 you stay right here. They're coming <laughs> to get her right now. And I'm thinking, boy, this is strange. This has never happened to me before. And so then before we went to court, like a week later, two of our sergeants came to me and they says, Hey boy, he said, you know, we do a lot of off duty work for these guys and they really take good care of us. You, you think you could do anything to help her case? And I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I love cops. I was still a rookie. I was still on probation. I'm like, sure. Whatever you want to do, man, I'm going to drop it to a public intoxication or reckless driving. And they're like, okay, yeah, that sounds great. We appreciate it, man. We really do appreciate it. And I'm like, okay, no problem. So we go in there before the judge and, and, uh, the defendant doesn't even show up, <laughs> you know, that that's the time I ever saw that too. <laughs> and the uh, judge said, well, we got a case here involving miss so-and-so and, and officer Murphy, you're the arresting officer. Uh, you ready to proceed? And I said, you know, we didn't have a prosecutor in, the, in there with us. And, uh, I said, yes, sir. I said, you know, before we get started, I would like to reduce the charges here. And he's like, what? You want to do what? And I said, well, I'd like to reduce the charges for reckless driving public intoxication. You can't do that. And he starts berating me about that. I'm like, okay, well, let's go to trial. <laughs> you know, and by the way, I'm 19 years old. You, know, so, you can't uh, even buy your own bullets yet. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> so I presented the case out, you know, very succinctly, like I just did with you. And, and I said, well, you know, I didn't know how to end it. And I was like, well, judge, that's all I got. And, uh, he, he said, he started snickering. He's like, you know, the other attorney's name, I'm not going to say his name, but he's like, Hey, uh, so-and-so, I don't think that's much of a case. Do you, I don't think there's enough grounds here to charge her. I think we're going to dismiss the charges. <laughs> no, you know what? Better yet, we're going to reduce the charges to reckless driving and public intoxication. And I, you know, my chin hits the floor. There's a detective sitting in there because usually the chief would say that, but even the chief didn't come into this case. And the detective just fought in his chair laughing at me because I've never seen anything like this, you know? I mean, I really thought that it was equal justice under the law for everybody. And, and that was a rude awakening, you know, and I, I was very naive because hell, I was so damn young. Well, I got to ask you, when did the, when did the warning flags start going off for you? Like, where you really start figuring out like, Hey, something isn't right here. Something, one of these guys is not like the others. 
was it when you finally got to court? Was it when you get to the station and they release her right then? When was it when flags really started going off for you? The first one is when Tom said, you got this one, boy. <laughs> and he went and got the cruiser and left. <laughs> he left me up there alone. Uh, I, mean, I was there at the desk sergeant, you know, I mean, it wasn't alone. But uh, And then the chief showing up, that was an eye opener. And then not being allowed to take her up to lock up, which was three floors up. You had to take a little elevator to get up to lock up. Right. Uh, it's just a combination of things. It was. <laughs> it's funny now. Back then, it was uh, somewhat disheartening. You yeah, know, it really was. Well, you you move from being a police officer there and you actually go to the railroad police. Now, what is the what's the thought in your head doing that when you're going from being a police officer to moving over to railroad? Because you, you kind of always talk about in the book that you always kind of wanted to be in the thick of things. Mm -hmm. I would think that when you look at railroad police, though, you would think not going to be a lot of action. You might see things and you might get to investigate maybe bigger cases, but not a lot of action from day to day. <coughs> All right. Here's the main reason I went over. Okay. Money. Okay. Money. I mean, my, I doubled my salary by going to the railroad police. I have just gone or I was going through a divorce. I was almost through the divorce. Um, you know, I'd been, I'd worked six years as a uniform officer. Uh, in 1975, I started off at 9,600 bucks a year. I was working every minute of overtime I could get. I worked as an electrician's helper. Um, I landed the sports contract for the local uh, state college. So we did the football and basketball games. Uh, I was just working my butt off, you know, and still I think the most I ever made was like 17,000 in a year. So, uh, you know, the railroad started me off at uh, the high twenties and <clears throat> I moved to Norfolk, Virginia. I was living in Virginia beach, which I love you know, my wife. Well, my wife now, uh, we love the beach, um, but it, it got me out of a rough situation there going through divorce. And, you know, it's, I wouldn't wish divorce on anybody. It's horrible. I mean, even if you don't like each other, it's still horrible to go through. Um, but you're exactly right. I was a glorified security guard and I'm not taken away from the railroad cops. I mean, I, some of my best friends are still on the job out there and, um, and they do a fantastic job. And, and some agencies are more involved in criminal investigations than others. It just so happened. And I was always the youngest guy you know, on the shift. So, you know, I got all the crap details and, uh, I was, you know, nighttime shaking doors and checking vehicles and buildings. And, uh, there was one exciting, I did, I did two years in Virginia beach and then moved back to Bluefield to be closer to my sons and my two sons. And, uh, I heard shots being fired. It was a Saturday night, Sunday morning type thing. Heard shots being fired just a couple blocks over, went to see what the noise was. Cause you know, we're noisy. I mean, nosy we're cops. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there's a, there's a city officer down there and he's a rookie and he is, he is down on the street, hiding behind his cruiser, swapping shots with a guy on the third floor. So the guy's got the high ground on him and, he, and the guy on the third floor is using a 44 Magnum. We didn't know at the time, but man, that thing, every time he pulled the trigger, it sounded like a cannon going off. And what had happened is he came home and he called a, another man in bed with his wife. And so that guy's trying to run away and he shoots him right in the butt as the guy's running down the steps. We gets down to the street level and falls out. So what the guy's trying to do is shoot out the third floor window and kill the guy. So I ran over next to the rookie and I'm like, man, you got help on the way. And he's like, Oh crap. No, I don't. So he got on his radio and I'm thinking, dude, the first thing you do is call for help when you're shooting, man. That, you know, you can't have enough people out there. So, uh, you could see what was going on. So I ran over and, and dragged the wounded guy into a recessed doorway just to, so, you know, you don't want to see a murder. And, uh, ran back out there to the cruiser and, and I'm kind of laying on the ground trying to hide under the cruiser. Cause when somebody's shooting at you, it's amazing how small you can get. Absolutely. And backup shows up and you know, we're, I mean, we, <laughs> we killed that building dead in hell. Nobody ever hit the shooter though. <laughs> He'd fire around and we'd fire like 20 shots back, you know, but long story short, finally he gave up and, and uh, that, that was probably the most action I saw. But then, when I called my chief, you know, I stayed out on site to help him process the crime scene and all that. And so I got back in the office about six 30 on a Sunday morning, called my chief at home. And I said, chief, Hey, I was just involved in a shooting, letting you know. And he got ticked off. He's like, you don't go anywhere. I said, well, I got another hour on my shift, so I'm not going anywhere. So he comes in and he just, I mean, up one side and down the other rip, rips me across the hot coals. He said, uh, give me a weapon which back then I was carrying a revolver. I had a model 15, six shot. 
And so I opened the cylinder and I dumped the rounds out and handed him the weapon. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah, I, you took the bullets out. And I'm like, cause you never hand a loaded weapon to anybody, chief. I mean, geez, that's just like cop 101 training. Well, how do I know how many bullets you fired? And I said, do you think I'm walking around with a bunch of empty casings in my revolver? I reloaded last night. It was just, but you know, he told me he's going to get me fired. Um, he's going to get my job for that because I went and helped the police officer. And as I'm walking out the door, going home that morning, I said, chief, I'm going to tell you right now, given the same circumstances, I'll react the same way again. So, uh, that, you know, that just gave me the incentive to finish my college degree and, and, uh, buddy of mine, Pete Ramey, um, He's the one that got me interested in DEA, and that's how I ended up in DEA. Well, so when you when you talk about that, you've had a couple of scrapes so far. Nothing nothing major, but disheartening uh, things to you about your career. I mean, you helped out save a guy from getting murdered. You get chewed out. Um, so the 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 question would be to me, are you disheartened about law enforcement yet? Or are you, you're still okay. You're just trying to find that perfect fit for you. Cause that's what I think you were doing was looking for that perfect fit where you get the action, the pay, the, you know, actually being a police officer, all those things. Mm -hmm. Do you finally get to that? I did with the EA. I, I wasn't sure that's where I want to go. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was concerned that DEA and in, in federal law enforcement, DEA is the only single mission agency. You right. know, they just do narcotics. And I, I, I was always interested in narcotics, but I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I got a long way to go to retirement. This might get a little redundant and boring. Um, boy, was I wrong. I, I loved it. I love, I wish, you know, I wished I'd gone to DEA years earlier, but, uh, um, then I think you're getting ready to ask me a question here soon about why I loved it so much, how I knew. Well, yeah, I, I think I know from the book already why you loved it so much, but, um, I, I think that you really, this is kind of in the book where you take off, you know what I mean? Like you really can tell that you're really into it as you tell your other stories of when you worked in Bluefield and all those different kinds of things, um, nothing, nothing really to it. Um, as you go to the DEA though the world kind of opens up, uh, you get done and you go to Miami. I mean, for your first place, Miami vice is on TV. Like <laughs> this is the life now. Yeah. So how are you feeling when you get to there? Oh man, I'm like a kid in a candy store. It was, you know, 1987, Miami was still the wild west down there. There were, uh, lots of drug related murders, different things going on. Um, uh, and yeah, I'll be honest with you. I was extremely naive. Um, you know, I'm a small town country boy. Right. Um, my wife and I, we got down there, uh, the guys in the, in the, in my enforcement group, we'd go out and have a group lunch and they, we'd go to, you know, a Hispanic restaurant and nobody spoke English. The rest the menus are in Spanish. I'm like, what the hell did we drive across the bridge and come to Cuba? And we're, you know, we're still in the United States. And I was as redneck as you could get, you know, I'm like, I right. want a menu in English and I want a waitress that speaks English. This just being stupid. I mean, just young and stupid, to be honest with you. Um, but you know, when you're living now, all of a sudden in a big city, that's got a lot of action and you know what, to this day, Miami is still my wife and I's favorite city in the entire United States. I wow. love that place. Uh, well, you say I don't that know in the book too. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think I want to live there anymore because it's really fast paced and I'm getting old and you know, we just moved to Orlando. I'm, I'm sitting in Orlando right now and, uh, we were able to get out in the suburbs a little bit. So it's a little bit slower pace out here. It's still pretty crazy down in Orlando. I mean, it's still Florida. You, you can't leave, uh, <laughs> you, you can't leave that out. Like I said before that you're there at the height, your Miami vice is going on. I mean, everything's happening and, and you know that, that, that you're really in the big time now, but do you ever feel being in the big time? Do you ever feel like, Ooh, I maybe stepped into the deep end of the pool before I was ready for it. Honestly, no. And it's, uh, <laughs> you know, what I like to say is DEA didn't hire me because I was real smart. <laughs> I think they needed a token hillbilly and that was me. Um, <clears throat> I never felt like that though. I always felt like, uh, even when I was talking to Pete Ramey on the railroad and, you know, and he was always encouraging me to, to follow whatever I want to do. And uh, it just, he was one of the best friends I've ever had in my life still is. Um, 
I'm thinking, I know how to run investigations. I know how to do undercover. I know how to do surveillance, not to the level that we were doing in DEA, but of course I had experience in things like that. And, uh, I thought, you know, there's nothing special about these guys. They, they talk different than me and they, you know, they might be from big cities, but I can hold my own weight here. And at least, you know, I thought I could. <clears throat> and I met my first partner, Gene Frankar, who was probably the smartest man I ever met in DEA. Just phenomenally intelligent. Do you think still to him, this day, that's the smartest yeah. man? No kidding. He's one of the smart. I mean, he was squared away. He was just an intelligent man. He was uh, a little bit dumpy looking. He had a baby face. Uh, he wore the Guaybera shirts like a lot of the Cuban men wear down there, uh, wore polyester pants and these raggy ass uh, penny loafers. Just uh, last guy in the world you'd expect to be a cop, much less a DEA agent, you know. He's the tech but, guy uh, from Miami Vice. <laughs> he was uh, he was unbelievable. And, and even when you got to the part where you're starting to go out on cases on your own a little bit, you know, you're, you finally learn the right. system and, and learning the paperwork system in DEA was a nightmare uh, just because it's so different. But um, you, you still ran, if you were smart, you still ran potential cases by your training partner, your training officer. We call them FTA, field training agents. Right. And it, uh, that one case where an informant called us and says, hey, I got somebody who wants to meet me at Denny's on 36th Street next to Miami Airport. You know, he wants to set up a deal for some several hundred kilos of cocaine. Well, you know, as young agents, we're all excited. But I went and talked to Gene about it. And he said, well, sounds like it's got potential, but you need to be careful because this sounds a little bit too good to be true. And that's when, you know, real long story short, turned out it was high Leah PD were the bad guys. And they weren't bad guys. They thought we were the bad guys. Right. So it very easily could have been a blue on blue shoot out there. Well, and you bring that up. I, I mean, that's why deconfliction was made. That's why mm -hmm. that, that happens now because of those blue on blue incidences. And, and back then, even I wouldn't even have thought maybe law enforcement, I would have thought more uh, bad guys trying to set you up for a rip. Well, you always had to worry about that. That's why, you know, pre-surveillance is a, is a big to do when you're in a place like that. You need to get out there early and just see what's going on to make sure you're not being set up. So I think my favorite case when you first started the DEA, and we talked a little before the show about this, um, was the sport fish boat that you took. Yeah. That was going to be, I think in your head, when I read the book, you thought this was <laughs> what was going to make you right here. This, this trip was going to put your name on the map. Uh, you found out quickly on the trip, though, it wasn't quite working out to the way you thought it was going to. You had two different captains. You had a lot of stuff going on that wasn't expected to happen. So I want you to walk us through that one because I want to show the difference of when you're a young agent and mm -hmm. as you go into Columbia and, and almost kind of the difference in the way you work. Because you would agree that you work these very differently. I think you were very starry-eyed mm -hmm. in this first one, and you were very much a realist when you get to Columbia. Right. So it was, <clears throat> I mean, it was, you know, you got down there and, and everybody wore boat shoes down there. I had to go buy a pair of boat shoes because I'm used to wearing tennis shoes or going barefoot, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I went and bought boat shoes and this was Gene's case. He'd been working it for a couple of years. He had a couple of these old informants, we call them Cheech and Chong. Uh, and they set up this deal for 400 kilos of cocaine. So the, the way that they had sold the deal to the bad guys was that they had uh, various methods of transportation that they could use to smuggle drugs. And it could be an airplane, it could be a boat, you know, whatever they needed. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry to keep coughing. I've got a sinus infection. I'm fighting with here a little bit. So uh, they were going to use this boat. Well, DEA had an undercover boat, a 53 foot Hatteras sport fisherman. I had no idea what the heck that was. <laughs> you know, I had a John boat that I used to go bass fishing in. I knew what that was. And you right. had to use paddles with it. You know, you had oars. You didn't, you didn't have a motor. So uh, they took me out and looked at it. And it's one of the nice fishing boats with a chair in the back and all that thing and all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was seized from a bad guy. And DEA had taken it and wired, you know, put hidden cameras, hidden microphones throughout the entire boat. So they had a lot of meetings on the boat and everything was recorded. You know, nobody was the wiser. So they, they need, they've got two boat captains who are DEA agents and they need somebody to go with them as a deckhand. 
And I told Gene, I'm like, hey, brother, we're partners here. I go. <laughs> you know, and he said, well, you ever been on the ocean before? Well, hey, I went on a cruise ship once. You know, is that the same thing? <laughs> and uh, he, you know, I'm sure I, I made Gene laugh all the time because he's thinking, what an idiot. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, because I didn't see Josh Gene Sheridan. showing up for to be a deckhand. Yeah, he was a little bit smarter than me. He's a whole lot smarter than me. <laughs> so, another agent named John Sheridan, who's a super guy, he meets me out at the boat one day. He says, Look, I'm going to show you a few things about what a deckhand does. And he taught me how to coil the lines and how to throw them over, you know, when, when you're pulling up to a dock and just, you know, some really basic stuff. And I thought, I'm ready to go, brother. Let's go. So I think it was, I think it was February. We thought we were going to go in January and then it got postponed to February. And, uh, so we take off It's me and the two boat captains and, um, you know, we're heading over to the Bahamas and, and man, we're just a few hours out of Fort Lauderdale and it's a twin engine boat and they hit a, re they, something happens to one of the motors. So we stop and, and one of the captains dives in the water and he comes back and it's like, we've been a prop. So we limp, we limp into one of the keys there in the Bahamas and, called DEA and they said, well, you know, if you can get to Nassau, there's a sub tender down there for the U S Navy, we'll fly you a new prop over and, you know, and they'll put it on for you. And that was when I first realized, wow, DEA has, you know, the connections that the, they've got the U S Navy on standby to put a new propeller on our boat. And sure enough, that's what happened. We limped into Nassau and, and a couple of divers came over and they fixed the boat for us. So that was, now we're going into day three when we're leaving Nassau heading down to Turks and Caicos. I never heard of the Turks and Caicos. I didn't know where we were going. I thought, you know, my knowledge was you had the Bahamas and then there wasn't anything else till you got to South America. That's how stupid I was. I mean, just, I can't tell you how naive I was. You know, I, I think you're letting enough. everyone know that perfectly well. With this oh story. my gosh. It was, uh, I just thank the good Lord for keeping me alive all these years. You know, but, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's like the end of day three and the two boat captains are starting to get seasick. Now, I'm not used to being on the ocean, but watching them get sick, I'm starting to get that sympathy sickness as well. Mm -hmm. I never threw up, but I was queasy. And, you know, I, they, <laughs> they said, listen, if you come up to the highest point of the boat, that's what, you know, you'll get over it. I'm thinking that makes no freaking sense at all because it's going to be doing more of this up there than anywhere else, you know. So I never did. But, uh, and so they were throwing up and I never got that point. But uh, one night, uh, I told him, I came up and I said, look, we got autopilot. I've been sleeping in the daytime. You guys have been throwing up, go get some sleep, put this thing on autopilot. Tell me what to do. You know, I've been watching you for four days now. And if anything happens, I'll come and wake you up. And so they agree to it. And, and they said, now here's the radar. And it had one of those hoods on it. You had to put your eyes on it like this. And they said, just keep a, an eye out. We don't, you know, main thing, don't run into something. And the radar would reach out 17 miles all the way around us. I'm like, got it. So they go to bed. It's like three or four o'clock in the morning and I go to check the radar and I'm looking and there's nothing out there. And then it hits me. You're 17 miles from anything and you don't know what's on past that 17 miles. If the boat sinks, I could probably swim two miles, maybe three miles if I was really scared, but there ain't no way I could <laughs> in hell I could sleep, swim 17 miles, you know? And, uh, it, it, that was a real, uh, wake up dose of reality. And then when daylight came along, all of a sudden I started, I thought I was hallucinating because I saw stuff jumping out of the water. <laughs> well, the two captains, they come back up and they're like, I'm like, do you guys see something jumping out of the water? And they're like, yeah, that's called flying fish. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, but then when we, I mean, and it just went downhill for that whole day and we came pulling into the bay there at Providencialis. And, uh, you know, we had a rubber raft on the front. They call it Zodiac with a motor. And uh, we pulled up and I said, put the Zodiac in the water. And they're like, well, we're not ready to go to shore yet. We've got things to do on the boat. And I don't give a damn. Put the, put the Zodiac in the water. And I went, I didn't have a duffel bag. I had a Samsonite suitcase. Went and got my Samsonite suitcase. And uh, they said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to shore. I'm, I've had enough of you guys. Screw you. <coughs> and, uh, it, you know, we were getting close to fist fights. That's how bad it was. And they said, well, what do you think you're going to do? And I said, Gene's going to be over here with the rest of the group. I'm going to go sleep in the floor of his hotel room. And that's exactly what I did. So, uh, you know, we finally got over. But uh, so the deal doesn't go immediately. And, you know, back then we called these are Hummers. It's humming along. So uh, I flew back to Miami with the rest of the group. Two boat captains stayed on the boat. And they're like, Murph, you should stay down there with them. Oh, heck no. <laughs> Somebody will die. It might be me. It might be them. Somebody's going to die if I stay down here. 
So I went back and then they got the deal set up two weeks later. We flew back down. And so I go with two boat captains and a cop from Providencialis and we're all undercover and we go out to the far end of the runway at the Providencialis uh, airport. And it's not big. It's got one air strip. I don't think it even have a taxiway, you know? And so the plane flew in from the West landed came all the way to the end of the runway to turn around. And when they did, the back door flew open. This is a twin engine. Uh, the back door flows open and all these green duffel bags come flying out. Then they close the door. They taxi back up to the terminal. They refuel. They take off, went back to where they came from, which was Cuba. So, you know, we're getting cocaine out of Cuba. Now, that's a big deal because it's a communist country. And we all know who's in charge down there, right? Right. So we went collected the duffel bags and, and uh, we brought them over to the police station, did some field tests on everything, made sure it was testing positive for coke, for coke. Then DEA air wing flew a, a twin engine. I think it was a conquest is what they had at the time. And we loaded all that up in there and, and to maintain chain of custody, I had to stay with the dope. Well, the plane was so packed with duffel bags. I had to climb on top of the duffel bags and lay on top of them all the way back to Miami. You know, there wasn't like a 15 minute trip. It was a couple hours flight, you know, <laughs> um, but, and here's the funny thing about that. When I was a, a uniformed police officer, the most powder cocaine I'd ever seen in my life was two ounces. And we're in a baggie, you know, about like this down there, we picked up 400 kilos. So I went from two ounces to 880 pounds of Coke. And I tell everybody I was addicted to cocaine at that point, just in a different way, man. I knew I'd found the right job. I thought this, I, I can't think of anything more exciting than this. And boy, did my career, you know, I think I was lucky enough to really experience a lot of cool things in my career. Well, I don't even think that you care that you're laying on these duffel bags. I mean, with that oh, much didn't. cocaine, yeah, you, you did not care. Um, and I, one other thing about that trip, didn't when the captains woke up uh, after that night of you watching the autopilot, didn't they blame you for something that went wrong? Yeah. And you were like, I didn't touch I, anything. I, I haven't touched. I, I know better than to touch anything, you know? I don't know if they were having nightmares or what the oldest one. And he was, he was the best looking undercover for a boat captain you'd ever meet. I mean, he looked like freaking uh, what, uh, who's the pirate on the, you know, that popular movie series with Johnny Depp. Oh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was crusty looking. He had the ruddy skin, the dark tan, you know, and here I am a boat. I'm supposed to be a deckhand and I'm lily white, man. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a sun tan. I had a sun <laughs> But uh, yeah, it worked. Uh, yeah, but they thought they're like, well, something had to have crossed our path for us to be off course like this. I, I said, I didn't set the course. You set the course and nothing has been touched. I I'm, I'm promise you I haven't touched a thing. And, 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 you know, that just didn't help the situation at all either. Yeah, uh, I, I, I really like that story a lot because. I look at that one and it ends up, everything ends up great in it. Um, you guys get what you needed, but then <clears throat> you decide you want to step into the major leagues now. And, and you actually were a little different than Javier and Javier didn't, from what I understand, he didn't really want to go to Columbia. He wanted to work the Mexican border uh, because he knew about Nuevo Laredo, all those different kinds of things. You on the other hand, had talked to Connie and you guys wanted to go to Columbia. You thought that that's the, that's the next thing. Now, my first question out of that is you've been in Miami literally during, I mean, right at the end of, of, uh, like you said, Miami vice and stuff, but you're talking about the cocaine cowboys and all those kind of things. And you're seeing all that there and you see where it's coming from. And you decide that you want to go there. What was the, what was the kind of the point that you were making with that by going to Columbia? Because you were getting all the action that you could, you could stand in Miami. You're going into a whole different kind of world in Columbia. So what was your thinking behind moving there? Well, um, I had been working uh, some cases with the DA office in Barranquilla. And uh, <clears throat> uh, got to be good friends with an agent down there, Ed Dickey, who's retired now. And we were seizing some large amounts of cash in Miami based on what was going on in Barranquilla. Um, and, and back then, I'm you know, $1.3 million, that was a massive cash seizure. That's nothing nowadays, but excuse me. So um, <clears throat> Ed started talking to me about, you know, you ought to think about transferring down here. And Ed was an old country boy from Mississippi. 
you know, he was just as redneck as I was. And I'm thinking, well, heck, if he can do it, I could probably do it. And uh, so my wife has been a registered nurse her whole career since college. She really liked the blood and gut stuff, you know, the trauma centers and the ICUs and CCUs and, and that kind of thing. And uh, I, which I think is all gross to be quite honest with you, but that was her excitement. And so about after three, three and a half years, she said, you know, I mean, we really got to see a lot of things in South Florida and just fell in love with the place and, and really got into the culture and, you know, got over being a stupid redneck where, you know, yeah, people speak Spanish. Well, that's just a different culture, man. It accepted. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's when it got to be a lot of fun when you do that. And she comes to me one day and she's like, you know, these last few years in Miami have really been exciting. What's the next most exciting thing we can do? And I said, well, you want to, we can transfer down to Columbia. And she's like, are you freaking kidding? Have you been drinking again? You know, and she looked at me like I had three eyeballs and, and, uh, I'm like, Hey baby, you asked. And, and you gotta understand when I first met Connie, I used to ride motorcycles. When I met her, she owned her own motorcycle. Now, how can you not fall in love with a woman that owns her own motorcycle? Right? <laughs> so, uh, she had a real adventuresome side to her. And so I knew from her personality, just leave it alone. And a couple weeks after that, she came to me, she's like, you still want to go to Columbia? And I said, yeah, if you're interested, I'm, I'm willing to go. And she said, if we're going to do it, let's do it while we're young. And so I went and applied and uh, actually got selected for Baron Kia. And uh, they <clears throat> ended up taking it away from me because they needed a native Spanish speaker uh, right away. And I understand that. So a couple weeks go by and I was really ticked off about it, to be honest with you. I was very disappointed. And uh, a couple of weeks go by and a guy from headquarters, I don't know, calls and says, hey, you know, you just got screwed, right? And I said, yeah, I can figure that out. And he said, uh, well, listen, we got three openings coming in Bogota. You want to go to Bogota? I said, sure okay <laughs> and so lo and behold i got selected for bogota now if i had gone to that baron kia job i would have never been working on the escobar case because they weren't you know they're working a lot of coastal freighters and go fast boats and things like that up there san andreas islands the rosario islands all that stuff up there so that's uh that's how i ended up in bogota it was you know it was kind of i don't know if you call it by accident or happenstance or i think everything uh, happens for a reason and I'm with you. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that, that that worked out for you. Now, your wife's only kind of stipulation for moving to Columbia, the cat had to come with you. <laughs> but yeah, that's true. <laughs> the cat proved the most difficult part of the journey once you get to Columbia. Yeah, it's not quite what was shown in, in Narcos. Well, I'm talking about <laughs> the book where they hold you and they, they don't really yeah. know... I guess if they got to put the cat in quarantine or whatever it was, but, but they were not happy it, it, from what I understood from the book, they weren't happy with the cat. Yeah. And, and we had done, we've, you know, I'm a very organized person. We had done all, all that stupid ass paperwork. We'd gotten all the vet signatures. We've gotten all the tax stamps and all the crap you got to do, you know, when you show up down there and here they are yanking your chain. And then it's a Sunday night. It's like nine thirty, ten o'clock at night on a Sunday night. And the duty at the DEA duty agent had to come out and pick us up at the airport, to take us to a hotel. And he, you know, I mean, we part, I found out later how much we partied on weekends down in Columbia. And he's, he's about hung over cause he'd been drunk all weekend and he's a fluent Spanish speaker and he's not happy that a gringo got the position and he's not happy to be there at all. And he's just treating us like crap. And, uh, <clears throat> we ended up having some words later on he ended up being one of our best friends <laughs> still is to this day but um you know and then when he heard about the cat and the issues there he's like oh my god this is just gonna take so much longer and i gotta work tomorrow and you know and um uh it got to the point where it's like guys what are you gonna do are you gonna kill our cat and eat it or are you gonna give it to us so we can take the damn thing home <laughs> and, and you know finally but after hours you know we finally got puff and, and got out of there I don't know what the problem was now, you know, the narco series that shows that they were photo and they did photocopy my passport, but did they fax that up to Pablo Escobar? I don't think so, but who knows? Who knows? Maybe they did. Well, you know, and for, for the sake of our conversation, I'm going to go mainly from the book because I know, and you've said it in past speaking engagements <laughs> and stuff that the show was really Hollywooded up. And we'll touch on a couple of those points of, of being, you know, Hollywood and the story up. Um, cause I think it just adds a little to it. Now, as you get there, you're on the ground now in Columbia. Um, 
with Javier, there's a difference. And of course he couldn't be here tonight, but I want to hear from your side. There's a difference between you guys. You're married. Uh, you've got like the married life. He's a single guy. Um, what was the difference for you guys on the ground in Colombia? Like, how how do you approach work? Is that do I need to say that in a different way, or or, or are you approaching the it. cases in a different direction? Well, when I got there, I didn't know what case I was going to be assigned to. Nobody does, you know. You get there, and it takes you, it takes a week or two to get all your clearances and your badges and your, your briefings and, you know, all the threats they're going <laughs> to, you know, make against you, um, uh, and, you know, being state department and, um, and you're just kind of feeling your way around the office, getting to know everybody. And the only guys I knew were the guys I'd gone to language school with. And so they're newbies as well. And, uh, at that time, Javier was partners with a guy named Gary Sheridan. So Gary and I got to talking and, and uh, Gary's like Mr. GQ, man. He's extremely intelligent, speaks fluent Spanish, but he is dressed to a T every day. He's slim and trim and, you know, got the, you know, the fluffy hair and, and the women just swooned over him. Uh, but he was a really nice guy. And we got to talk and it turned out we had some uh, law enforcement acquaintances in common. He was an ATF agent before DEA and he was stationed in Charleston, West Virginia. So we had some common friends and that's how Gary and I got to be friends. And then Gary introduced me to Javier and, and, Javier's a little standoffish at, at, to start with because they were so busy. And that first week that I was there, I got, you know, I go to the embassy on Monday, Thursday is when Pablo surrendered. He took advantage of that self surrender program. And, you know, that's when he surrendered to his custom built prison. Right. And so I, I might've, you know, been a little smart ass walking around telling everybody, yeah, yeah, you heard Murphy's in town. He just decided he better give it up before I catch his happy ass, you know? And, <laughs> and so that didn't I'm go. Sure that that you, <laughs> I, I'm sure that won you so many friends. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're like, who's this jerk? <laughs> so, um, but then Gary found out he, you know, we're doing wiretaps with the Columbia national police and, and all this stuff. And we're trying to glean information out of the prison, you know, cause Pablo's up here in this country club and you know, that whole year he was in prison, we did not get one single intercept out there. We were getting informant information, but it was, it was kind of dubious at best, you know? Um, so Gary gets promoted and moved up to Baron key to be the boss. And so that's when Javier and I became full-time partners. And that was later in 1991. Uh, but what that did that first year is it gave me an opportunity to go through the case files. You know, I knew who Pablo Escobar was. I'd had all the cases I'd worked in Miami. That was Pablo's dope, but I never had a case that got me up to his level where I could indict him, you know, cause a lot of other guys did. Uh, <clears throat> so I had to learn about that. Uh, it also gave me an opportunity to take more Spanish classes in, in Colombia and get that Colombian dialect down. And there's, just like in the United States, there's different dialects in the different parts of the country. And, um, I still would never to this day, I'm still not as fluent as, as Javier is, but, uh, it also gave him an opportunity to introduce me to the Columbia national police, the unit we worked with. And it was a very elite unit called the Um, <clears throat> and because I was, since I was Javier's partner, they accepted me. Now I still had to earn their trust and respect, but it really broke down a lot of barriers there initially, just simply because Javier vouched for me. Now you, you look at us, uh, individually and beside each other, we are complete opposites. Uh, like you said, I've been married, you know, just about my whole life. Uh, Connie and I have now been married 37, 38 years, I think. Um, Javier is single, uh, he's married now, but, uh, he was never married back then. Well, you were probably read a book where he left that girl at the altar. <laughs> that wasn't a good yeah. thing. <laughs> He had to move on after that. Well, I, you know, I wanted to kind of leave that one for uh, for him oh, to ex no, 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 <laughs> I, just for him to explain. I didn't want to run across his path, and he say you you didn't let me tell my side. So, yeah, um, yeah but well, but you're right. You guys seem so opposite of each other. Well, I'm like I said, I'm a very organized person. You know, we just moved into our house here in Orlando, and and things aren't where they're supposed to be, and it just drives me up the freaking wall. Uh, so, you know, I, my wife says, well, some people say, I'm a, you know, my wife says I'm an asshole. She's probably right. So Javier is not organized. I mean, he had, I'm not kidding you. He might have a pile of papers this thick laying on top of his desk and mounted from corner to corner, but you could ask him for something. He'd pull it out of that damn pile. But here's the thing about Javier. I'm a good writer. Javier hated writing. Uh, he's got a mind though, like an encyclopedia. He just used to amaze me. I didn't have to go look up any files or anything. I say, Javier, I'm doing a, a, a 
teletype to headquarters about uh, DJ. You know, what's his relationship to the Escobar? Where does he fall in the hierarchy? You know, what is his responsibilities? Who's his family? Where do they live? He could rattle all, and to this day, he can still do the same thing. He can rattle all that stuff right off the top of his head, man. So that was, I guess that was, even the agent, other agents in the office were like, you guys, I mean, you guys are complete opposite, and you're the best team we got here. You know, and I'm, I didn't mean that to sound like I'm bragging, because we're not, but we really did compliment each other. Absolutely. Um, and to this day, we're still the same. You know, I, I kind of run our businesses, and uh, I don't make decisions without his input. Uh, I did screw up tonight and forgot to tell him about your, your podcast. So I'm hoping we can get him on a later date. And he's he's flying out. He was flying out somewhere today. I'm, I'm guessing it's either New Orleans or Las Vegas to go gambling, but I don't know that. <laughs> uh, but I'm guessing that's where it is. <clears throat> and I don't gamble. See, so yeah, there's another difference between us. <coughs> but I will say this about uh, he did have a lot of girlfriends down there. And, you know, and, and uh, well, I like to joke around, you know, we have a keynote speaking business. It's our six year traveling around the world speaking about the Escobar story. And um, uh, I mean, it's really, it was busy before COVID. We were averaging 75 appearances a year. I saw oh, him wow. and I saw Connie. But uh, the one thing that was true, you know, eh, just, the, just a blunt way to say it, Javier's a man slut. Okay. <laughs> I don't make him a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was single. I tell you what, though. A couple of his girlfriends were former Miss Columbia's. You know, he's, I mean, he wasn't dating uh, well, the ugly women. I, I guess that, yeah, I guess <laughs> that kind of brings me into the question. And it's the thing that kind of fascinated me the most about the book. So you do a law enforcement job, which is, is nerve wracking, is, is scary in itself, um, doing the law enforcement job, uh, the, just the ris risk and responsibilities that you're taking on. But you go to Colombia, and it's a whole different world because you're living in Colombia. Like, and and when I say you're living in Colombia, you're not living like on barracks. You're living in Colombia. There's car bombs going off. There's gang wars that are going on. There's a three hundred thousand dollar bounty on you and Javier. Uh, how do you approach that with your wife? Because she's adventurous, but I don't know that she knew that she signed up for all that. No, she did. That's um, Ed Dickey, the guy I told you that I worked with out of Baron Kia, flew up to Miami one night and we had dinner with him because she wanted to pick his brain and he knew okay. what was coming. She spent three hours grilling him with everything, every question she could think of. And, and I didn't hide the violence from her. You know, I, I, she knew about the security restrictions and all that down there. So she went in with her eyes open. But I got to tell you, man, she's, I, I don't consider myself a brave person. I'm not a tough guy by any means. Uh, I do have a, very strong work ethic as Javier does also. And I think I got that from my dad. Uh, so, um, you get down there and, and I'm, I'm worried about her and she's like, no, you don't do your job and I'll do my thing. And she started out working in the embassy post office and then switched over. <clears throat> uh, there's a position in the embassies. There used to be, I don't know if it still is, it's called the community liaison officer. And that's the American that when new Americans are coming into the embassy, they set up welcome packages and help them find housing and all that kind of stuff. And uh, she was also in charge of the, uh, we all lived in apartments except for the ambassador. Everybody in the embassy lived in an apartment. The ambassador had the ambassador's residence, which is a nice mansion, you know, with several acres of land and right in the middle of Bogota, it was beautiful. Uh, and he also had tennis courts. And the clothes, the, the community liaison officers were in charge of the schedule for the tennis courts. Well, it just so happened our boss at DEA, Joe Toff, was an avid tennis player. And he told Connie, he says, I don't care what Steve does. Every, you know, I don't, I don't say every Sunday or Saturday, I need the one o'clock time slot. <laughs> and what would happen is on Monday morning, everybody would line up outside the clothes office to get their time slots, first come, first serve. But Joe always got the time slots he wanted. There <laughs> you take go. Care, care of the boss, right? Yeah, there, there you go. She would... Uh, uh, she, and she would go shopping. We lived about three blocks from the biggest mall in Bogota, in the north part of the city, Unicentro. She'd walk over to Unicentro, you know, she had dark hair and she's got dark eyes, not dark skin, but um, she blended in a lot better than I do. I've got, you know, I'm 6'2". Back then I had brown hair. I actually had hair. Um, I have light colored eyes, you know, and, and when I would go with her, <laughs> People in the mall, men would stop in the mall and just stare at me as I walked by. And I'm thinking, man, is my fly open? Have I got a booger hanging out of my nose? I got something in my teeth? What's going, what's going on here? And I guess they hadn't seen that many Americans. 
but uh and you know it made me a little uncomfortable and i was always carrying a weapon because we had permits down there absolutely <clears throat> connie didn't have a weapon she goes shopping she would go to the nice places and go barter prices she would exchange things and I asked her one day, I'm like, how in the world do you do this? You don't speak the language. You don't know the culture. How are you doing this? And this is when we found out what Colombians are really like, because, you know, it's, it's wrong to stereotype anybody. The only Colombians I'd ever met were the Colombians I put in jail in South Florida. I've stereotyped the whole country as drug dealers. That's, you know, that's all that lives in Colombia. Right. What we found about, out about Colombians is if you go in and you're willing to accept their culture, Use what Spanish you knew, you know, geez, even if it's just a few words here and there, but you're trying to get along, be willing to laugh at yourself, use hand gestures. <clears throat> Colombians are some of the most accepting people you'll ever meet in the world. But now you go with that ugly American attitude, they'll tell you real quick where the airport is and, you know, fly your happy butt on out of here if you don't like our culture. So, you know, I admired that about the country. Um, and it, it shocks people when we say that because we all, you know, Javier and I always give Colombians tons of credit especially the Colombian National Police for that whole operation. Uh, and to this day, we still promote Colombia. My, my oldest son is a, a, a orthopedic surgeon in Atlanta at Children's Hospital. And he and his wife get together, some of their friends once a year, they travel, you know, Mexico, a place like that. And pre COVID, they were going to go to Cancun and man, I'd went through the ceiling, you know, cause I knew what was going on down in, in Mexico with the drug dealers and the violence. And he's like, well, <clears throat> and he was 40 years old. And I said, I'm forbidding you to Mexico. He's like, dad, I'm 40 <laughs> years old. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, son, I, you know, I'm re just really worried about your safety. He said, I got it. I got it. Where do you suggest we go? And I said, you guys need to go visit Cartagena, Colombia. And he's like, are you kidding me? You're sending me to Colombia? What do you got a hit on me? You trying to collect the insurance? You know, and he's busting my chops big time, you know. So, but they went down there. They went to Cartagena. They went and spent a couple of days in Rosario Islands came back they said that's their new favorite vacation spot in the world because the you know it's there's a lot of history in cartagena there's the beautiful beaches they got some fantastic restaurants uh still got the old spanish fort that you can go into um and and that's you know i, I actually did the right thing that time sometimes i don't always do the right thing well you bring up an interesting point and i'm glad you did when when we talk about uh when you talk about um what is going on uh, over in uh, Colombia at that time and then Mexico now? Because I think that it's the it's the same problem. You you get that for the entire country. Yes. Now, I would I would say that it's different in Mexico with because it's so widespread through there. There's so many different cartels that there is a lot going on that's not the normal you know what i mean but i mm -hmm. think that that you're getting that idea because i won't go to mexico either and and it, it, is it different to you than colombia was because it feels different than those kind of wars were it is it, and and i'll tell you how dangerous mexico is we've been booked twice to go to mexico and speak you know in our our little world tour we right did. and <clears throat> when these producers book you they have to put a deposit down and both times they've called our agent back and canceled. They said, we can't guarantee their protection, you know, their safety down here. And we even contracted with them where they would pay for us to have a security detail that we picked, which would have been, you know, some former Delta force and SEALs team six guys that we worked with in Medellin. I mean, we love right. those guys. So, <clears throat> but there's a big difference between the two. Colombia, the violence that was created by Escobar and the Medellin cartel was all about fighting extradition of Colombian nationals to the United States. That's what the whole thing was. You know, if, if they did outlaw extradition for a while and then, you know, Pablo's ego uh, just got the best of him. You know, he thought he was some kind Absolutely. of you know, demigod. And, uh, that's what caused his downfall. You know, he tried to get into Congress and, and just, he really did some stupid things. Um, but you look at uh, uh, Mexico, it's just straight out corruption and violence. It's got nothing to do with extradition. It's got nothing to do with anything else. It's just, you know, they're going to be violent. Um, they're in, they are very intimidating. I, I mean, I'm not going to go to Mexico. I don't want my family going to Mexico. I'll never go back to Mexico. I don't think, uh, which is a shame because I have been there a lot and it, it is a beautiful country. Some of the, the old Aztecs runs and things like right. that they have down there, some of their history, but, uh, that's the major difference between the two. One was, <laughs> I hate to say that Pablo was fighting for an, an, an ideological reason because I don't think he was that deep, you know, 
mentally, but it was about the extradition thing. Whereas the Colombians are just, I mean, the Mexicans are just being straight out violent. You know, we've all seen the heads. I'm sure you've seen the photos of the heads that they chopped off and rolled down on the dance floor down there. I've seen photographs where that when they would torture people, they would use chainsaws to mm -hmm. cut limbs off and they would cut them from the armpit to the neck. And then they cut them from the hip down to the crotch. I mean, just nasty violence. Holy cow. It's just crazy down there. So when you talk about that and you talk about that, you think Pablo may have been more ideological and, and that it was about the extradition. This was a pretty interesting thing to me is when he goes to cath the cathedral, um, and I'm not even going to try and say the name of it. We've talked about it. So we'll just call it the cathedral, which there is pretty go. much a prison that, that he built. Right. Um, he, f I mean, even in the way that he arrives by flying in on a helicopter and handing off his gun belt and all these things, it has to be thought of right when it happens that kind of what the hell is going on here? Like th that's not a normal thing. And then when you see what is actually going on in the prison while he's there, I mean, they find that bag of money and he calls people and he murders them at the prison. Um, and, and that's what kind of, you know, gets the, the spotlight put on it, but that was going on the whole time. Like you said about the intercepts, the whole time he's there, there's no intercepts. How do you fight an enemy that you can't fight? Well, we just, <laughs> what little bit we could do. I mean, they were still producing cocaine. So, <clears throat> you know, we would target cocaine labs. Um, when they're out in the jungle, we, we, this is kind of funny. You'd have these informants that come in and they're like, yeah, I worked in the lab out there. I can take you right to it. Okay. Do you think you can find it from the air? Sure. I know that place like the back of my hand. We'd put them up in an airplane. You know, the northern part of the jungle looks exactly like the southern part of the jungle, which is 2,000 miles away. They'd never been in an airplane. They couldn't pick out a freaking lab from the air. And that happened over and over again. You know, I think occasionally we'd get lucky. They'd see some kind of landmark, you know, and they'd tell, okay, we're, in, we're getting closer and closer. But um, <clears throat> that, that was kind of it. We were trying to collect intelligence from anywhere we could around the world. We were trying to disseminate. We're still running wiretaps. And when I say we're running wiretaps, Columbia National Police, we're just supporting them. But they would give us all the information that, that was associated with the United States. And so we're sending those leads out to the U.S. as well as around the world where we have DEA offices. Um, and if you remember the story about Lakika, the Sicario who put the bomb on the Avianca plane, well, you know, <clears throat> on one of the wiretaps, uh, Javier was over in a wire room. And this, this new analyst yelled at him as he's walking by and says, Hey, Mr. Pena, he said, I think Lakika, his, his real name is Dan, Danny Munoz Mosquera. He said, I think Lakika's in the United States. And, and Javier looks at this analyst and there's a major or a lieutenant colonel with Javier. And the guy's like, oh, he's new. He don't know what he's talking about. You know, come on, let's go get some coffee. So they leave. Well, when Javier's ready to leave, he goes back in the wire room and gets that analyst. He says, why do you think Lakika's in the U.S. and where? And he said, well, you know, there's, here's the phone and, and the conversation, Javier listened to it. And they gave out a, uh, is it 213 area code for LA? And there was a phone number attached to it. Right. So, um, Javier takes that phone number and they thought, well, you know, we'll check it out and see what happens. Well, they, we call the LA office. They do a subscriber check. It comes back to a hotel. So we send a picture of Lakika up to them. They take that picture out to the hotel and they talk to the clerk and says, Hey, you, by any chance, have you seen this guy around here? And, and they're like, yeah, he just left a couple of days ago. So now, you know, alarm bells are going off. What the heck is, is Pablo's one of his most deadly Sicarios doing in the U S because we're not getting any information. So they track, uh, we sent Gary up to track him. They, and Lakeek had flown into LA through Mexico city. So Gary goes to LA meets with the agents there. We miss him. Uh, the next tip shows him that he's in Boston. So Gary hauls butt to Boston. We got the DEA officer working on it. We miss him there. Next thing we know, Lakika calls his mother <coughs> and we're doing a wiretap on her house, on her home number. Uh, she wasn't there. And he said, listen, tell mom to call me tomorrow night. As yeah, He didn't call her mom, but you know what I'm talking about. He says, tell mom to call me tomorrow night at this number. And it's a New York City number. So we call our office in New York. And, and by now, every DEA office in the United States is on alert. So we, as soon as we get that phone number, we call DEA New York. They do an emergency subscriber. It comes back to a pay phone. It wasn't Manhattan. I don't know if it was in the Bronx. Uh, I don't think it was Queens. But anyway, wherever it was. And, and the part of the message was, tell her to call me at this number tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. 
So we got the location and the time. So, you know, DEA New York, they send out, you know, he probably sent 200 agents out there to surround this phone booth. And sure enough, at 830, the phone rings and a Hispanic male walks over and picks up the phone. And, you know, and of course they swoop in and get him and they ask him for his name and he lies about his name. Well, he, you know, there's actually a statute on the federal law books that it's against the law to lie to a federal agent. So they call it a 1001 violation. Mm -hmm. And they typically use it for perjury in court, you know. So that's what they charged Lakika with. He goes to trial on it. Uh, there's this fantastic federal judge in, in New York, still on the bench, uh, Sterling Johnson. Uh, Sterling's the, we fly up to New York. And by the time the trial happens, I've already transferred back to North Carolina and Javier's in Puerto Rico. So we fly to New York for the trial. And, and uh, uh, first trial is a hung jury. Second trial, they find Lakika guilty of lying to a federal agent. You know what he got? <laughs> he got the max. Five years in federal prison for lying. <laughs> Hell, everybody you talk to lies to you as a cop, right? <laughs> so, but what that did is that gave DEA uh, an, a an agent named Sam Trotman up in New York. And if I just had dinner with Sam over at Disney the other night, um, hadn't seen him in 20 years, man. That's what I love about the law enforcement culture. We can go 20 years and not see each other, and you see each other. It's like we were together yesterday. Uh, so anyway, uh, they built a terrorism case because there were two American citizens on that Avianca flight that Lakika blew up. So he went to trial on that, was found guilty, and he lives out under the state of Colorado now. And although I've heard he might not be in Supermax anymore, but I'm not sure. But uh, he still claims his innocence. Uh, the Attorney General for Columbia wrote a letter to to uh, Judge Sterling Johnson saying that he didn't do it. And that's the same attorney general who let Escobar and all his henchmen self-surrender. Gustavo de Grief, he's a piece of work, too. Well, so. you know, in talking about that, there were supposed to be more people. I mean, that the bombing was bad in itself, but it could have been a lot worse because there were supposed to be key people on that flight mm -hmm. um, that was bombed. And just once again, by happenstance, they didn't get on that flight. Um. But this is going on constantly. You talk about in the book about the bombings and stuff that you guys heard 17 bombs go off in one night. Um, and, and it was bad because it was just indiscriminate. It was killing everyone. Now, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is the difference in what people felt about Pablo in the beginning. When you first get there, he turns himself in. He's kind of a, he's kind of a dub sane hood over there. You know, people are still behind him. And mm -hmm. as this war kind of stretches out and after the escape and, and the search, how are people's feelings about him different from when you got there to as you go through? Well, you know, <clears throat> our presentations are all about telling the truth. And so that's the way we approach interviews like this with you, DJ. And so everything I'm telling you is the truth. That one year that he was in prison, the car bomb stopped. You know, there was like this, it was kind of an uneasy calm and peace came over the country, but that those mass indiscriminate murders stopped. So, you know, the Colombians, and you think of it before I go to the rest of this way, just think about this. We're all upset as we can be about this deal that uh, Gustavo de Grief came up with and the government went through, you know, agreed to, excuse me. And the, the president at the time was Cesar Gaviria. And that's the guy that was supposed to be on the plane, on the Avianca plane, which is why Pablo put the bomb on there, because he knew Gaviria was pro-extradition. Uh, which you might not know, I can't remember if this is in the book or not, but there were supposed to be two DE agents on that plane, too. No, just it was in there. Cali. Was it in there? It was in there. <laughs> and we didn't have any information that there was going to be a bomb. It's just, you know, something happened in the embassy, and they had to cancel their flight, and they just scheduled it for a few days later or whatever. So very fortunate that, you know, we didn't lose more than what was lost on that that bombing. But when, when the public, when we found out about him killing Kiko Moncada and, and Fernando Galliano in there, and that's the two guys that, you know, supposedly had hidden this, I've heard as much as $23 million that Pablo's henchman found and it was rotting away. Um, when he killed them, we found out about it through an informant. Uh, we went to the ambassador who went to the president and said, you got to do something. This is out of control. And it finally got to the point where the ambassador had to tell the president, <clears throat> you either do something or we're going to the press. And so that's what led to them sending the deputy justice minister up there with the colonel from the Colombian military to tell Pablo, you know, we're going to relocate you for your own safety. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, and then we know what happened is they took the, the justice minister hostage. 
they brought in an elite group of, of Colombian military guys who stormed the prison, massive gunfight. No good guys were hurt. And believe it or not, that deputy justice minister walked out of there. I'm still shocked that that happened, you know, because all the Sicarius wanted to kill him while he was in there. It's just they were all about killing. That's what that's their life. You right. Know, they're assassins. So uh, now when he was on the run, uh, immediately, you know, the very next day, Javier and I flew to Medellin. That's when we started living up there for the next 18 months. And initially we, you know, we'd both be there together, but then as this thing started dragging out, it got to where the, you know, our boss wanted one of us in the embassy and the ambassador did too. And then when the other one had to be in Medellin, we weren't allowed to leave Colombia at the same time. One of us always had to be in country, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and you became the experts on the search for Pablo Escobar. And every week at the, uh, they called it a country team meeting, all the bosses from every section in the embassy would get together with the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission. And the first topic was give us an update on Escobar. I mean, that was top priority for the entire, entire U S embassy. Now, a lot of the agencies didn't like that, but especially state department, because they, you know, they were worried about when they're, when they're going to next want to have their little tea with somebody, which is a whole nother story with them. But, um, we should have caught Pablo within his first few weeks in no more than three months. The ambassador was a retired Navy commander. He brought in general Jerry Boykin, who's still a personal friend of mine. I did, we didn't get along too good back then, but uh, we've, we are still lifelong friends now who was the head of the U S army's Delta force. A couple of days later, SEAL team six shows up. So we've got these studs working and living with us up in Medellin for 18 months. I got to tell you, man, if you're, if I'm ever kidnapped, that's who I want to come and get me. Cause I know these guys, I know what they're capable of. They are unbelievable. Their work ethic is unparalleled. They're extremely intelligent. They know their jobs. I'm, oh my gosh. I'm just so impressed with them. And Javier is too. He'll tell you the same thing about them. <clears throat> so we were all ordered not to leave the police base in Medellin. And it was for safety reasons, you know, right. it was extremely violent. Well, the, uh, the operators did go up to the prison. And they set up some, uh, well, I don't know what the word is, surreptitious observation posts. And they brought in some resources that were just unbelievably good. And so there were several times in those first three weeks where we had Pablo located. And we would go, you know, we or either me or Javier would go to, to Colonel Penzone. He was in charge of this search block, this 600-man force that was created by the governor of Columbia with one mission to find and capture, capture or kill Pablo Escobar. So we'd go to Colonel Penzone and, and a lot of them, you know, would come in at, at, in the middle of the night. And so you got to knock on his door and he'd come to the door in his silk pajamas. So, you know, we all nicknamed him pajamas. So, Hey, go get pajamas up. We got some more, you know, lead information. So we go to him and say, Colonel, we need a, you know, we got good information. We need a, an assault force. You know, can you authorize some personnel? And, and we weren't asking for a lot. I mean, give us a, you know, a 10, 15, 20 man team and we'll go see what we can do. And he would have every excuse in the book. Well, it's the middle of the night. You know, we got formation at six o'clock. We got breakfast at five 30 or we got to do PT. We got to do inspection tomorrow. Uh, you know, it's just too late. I, I don't I think we're just going to wait and see you know, if we can, if it's there now to be there in the morning, that kind of thing. And so after several weeks of that, I mean, it got to the point where the ambassador's calling Javier up there. He's like, what the hell are you guys doing? You know, your, your operators are giving you all this great intel and you guys aren't doing crap with it. And so, you know, we were just real honest with the ambassador. You got to get this guy out of here. So the ambassador went to the president again and, uh, you know, explained everything to him and pin zone was out immediately. I mean, this guy, he wasn't happy that the green guys were there to start with. He didn't like us at all being in his, in his base. He was more, he was more pomp and circumstance than he was getting the job done. So what they did is they brought Colonel Hugo Martinez back. He, he was the leader in the first manhunt for Escobar before surrender. And then while Pablo was in jail as a reward, they let, they sent uh, Martinez, Colonel Martinez and his family to Spain, to the Colombian embassy in Spain, because that was a prime post for them. You know, it was kind of a thank you to be quite honest with you. And so when Martinez comes back, he's not happy. You know, he's not happy to be back there because Pablo has threatened numerous times to kill his family. You know, there was Colonel Martinez was living in an apartment complex in Bogota and all the other residents in the complex got together, and sent a letter and said, would you please move somewhere else? We're afraid that they're going to try and come and kill you and they're going to kill us by mistake. I mean, so this was a legitimate regular threat. <coughs> so um, when we got Martinez back, that's when things changed, man. But 
we were probably three months into the investigation by now. Pablo's got his feet back under him. He's got his resources lined up. You know, he's got his Sicarios working for him again. He's got his financial resources back available to him. He's up and running and gunning. And he declares war on Colombia for the second time. I mean, who declares war on their own country, right? I mean, we're not talking about some uh, lawless land over in, you know, wherever some other country. We're talking about South America. And there, you know, there are third world countries down there, but for one man to declare war on his country, you know, this guy had become so wealthy that he offered two different times to pay off the national debt of Colombia. That's how much money he was worth. And that was just going to be a drop in the bucket for him. Uh, it's just, it's ridiculous what was going on down there. So let's compare the two colonels. <coughs> and I want to ask your personal opinion. If you don't, if you don't feel comfortable saying it, is the first colonel on the take? I don't think so. I think he was just naive. Um, we never, never, never found anything that would indicate he was corrupt, you know, and <clears throat> there's wiretaps being done on everybody's phones. So right. not, not that we were doing it, but we knew about things and to our knowledge, nothing, I don't think he was corrupt. I so Mark, scared. I think he was a coward. So, okay. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. So he, <coughs> he is a coward. So it, is he afraid to do the right thing because he's worried that something's going to happen to his family or is he just not built for that kind of command? I think it's probably both. Okay. You know, um, I think that, and rightfully so to be worried about your family. Uh, cause Pablo, he made no bones about it. He'd tell you, if I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your wife. I'm going to kill your parents. I'm going to kill your children. I'm going to kill your dog. And then he would follow through with it. So it wasn't an idle threat. You know, it, it, it happened frequently. Um, uh, I think he was so much into the appearance of, you know, being on top of his game, looking good for the position. I'm in charge. And so I'm going to set an example that everybody else has to follow that he lost sight of what his mission was. I don't know that he ever knew what his mission was. Uh, I think he did not want to look bad in front of the president or the generals back in, in, uh, you know, headquarters in Bogota. Uh, and he ended up just being his own worst enemy because then everybody, I mean, nobody had respect for him after that. He got yanked out of that position because he wouldn't take action, you know, and I'm sure it probably ruined his career. I never heard from him again. I don't know what happened to him. I've got a feeling he may have retired soon after that. Well, when Martinez comes back, not only is it Colonel Martinez, but his son is actually a Lieutenant with you guys too, correct? <coughs> Yeah, he is. Uh, and his name's Hugo Martinez also. So he's a junior. And uh, now the lieutenant is extremely intelligent. My, uh, the colonel is very intelligent. I love the guy. He's, you want to meet a true hero. And he, he just passed away, I think, last year. Uh, so he's no longer with us. But true hero in law enforcement around the world. That's Colonel Hugo Martinez. I mean, just utmost respect. He made it up to the general ranks before he retired. But now Lieutenant Martinez came in, and, and his dad didn't want him there because he's worried about his safety. Right. But the lieutenant's like, dad, you know, I'm, I'm a professional cop, just like you. I got to do my job. And so what he did, he had a, a real brain for technology. He was uh, more of a techie kind of, uh, of a police officer than, a, than a tactical. I mean, he's good at tactics, but he was better at tech. So he taught himself how to use radio directional finding equipment. And he used to sit down with Javier. He, used to, he was so professional and so courteous. He would explain it to us. And you know, first of all, my Spanish, I had no, I didn't know any of the words in his vocabulary because it was all technical terms. And you just kind of sit there and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, smile every once in a while. Wow, that's pretty good. You know, <laughs> stop you. Wow. That's, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, and he was so excited about it. You want to be excited for him. Well, then on December 2nd, 1993, you know, we've, <laughs> so the, the governor of France had donated these vans that contained radio intercept equipment and radio directional finding equipment. And the principle that they operated off of was triangulation. So that tells you that you got to have three vans out there shooting for the signal and where the, where their lines intersect, that's where Pablo's radio phone is emanating from. But the margin of error was very large back then. So to refine that margin of error, you had to ride down the street with a meter in your hand and you're looking for the signal to get stronger. But the way you use that is you ride down the street, holding out the window like this. You know, I mean, it's something you see every day, right? Because <laughs> somebody riding down the street in their car with their arm out holding the antenna. <laughs> and so uh, the lieutenant finds a warehouse that he thinks that Pablo's at. So he calls in the Dahin unit, this plainclothes unit that we've been working with, and they assault the warehouse, and it's empty. And so, I mean, <laughs> you know how we rib each other when somebody 
does something goofy or stupid, you know, they just busted his balls for that. You know, you got, you have some of these wild goose chases. And so he said, well, let me, let me look, let me, let me do a little search. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And he found a, there was a body of water close by and water affects radio frequency. So he recalibrated his equipment to, to take that into account, went back out there. And so his little meter is telling him to drive down the street and he, and you know, he's got a driver cause he's, he's got, the, he's holding the meter in one hand and the antenna in the other. And his little meter tells him to, you know, look to your left. And he looks up there and he's and this own words. I mean, there's reenactment videos that he speaks on. Um, and he says, uh, you know, he calls his dad and he's like, uh, I have a hundred percent confirmation on Pablo Escobar's location. And you know what, dad, I'm looking at him right now. Now he says that Escobar looked at him as he drove by. And so we could never figure out why, well, why didn't Escobar react to that? Cause he's seeing something that's not common. You know, and he's the world's most wanted fugitive. Remember the, the TV show, America's Most Wanted? Yeah. They came down and did one episode of the world's most wanted. We took them to Medellin <laughs> for a week. They almost got killed, but we took them up there. So <clears throat> we went back and listened to Pablo's phone call, and he's talking to his son, Juan Pablo. And there's no reaction in his voice like, well, listen, son, I want you to call the president. So, what, what the heck is that? You know, like he realized there's something different driving down the street right in front of him. There was none of that. There was no slowdown. There was no breaks in this conversation. And the only explanation we've ever come up with is, you know, as you and I are talking now, DJ, I'm, I'm reliving things in my mind and, and you're seeing things that were in the book that you read and we're still seeing each other, but we're not really seeing what we're looking at. Right. Cause we're kind of in our minds, right. Uh, going through all these past activities. And that's the only thing we can come up with is that he was so engrossed in his conversation with his son about what he wanted, you know, I want you to call the president, the members of Congress, the press, this is what I want, you know, and all that stuff that he completely missed. He could have escaped, you know, but he didn't, he didn't realize what he was looking at that day. And sure enough, you know, the Lieutenant calls the Dehean guys in, they send a couple guys around back, they blow the front door and we don't all know what happens after that. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because I have a lot of questions about that. So when it's not calibrated correctly because of the water, they run on the uh, they run on the warrant, which you guys executed, I think, over 10,000 warrants in the hunt for him. Uh, it was a crazy number. But they yeah, run a little busy. Yeah. <laughs> they run this warrant. They they hit the wrong place. Is there any any facts or any evidence to show that Pablo saw any of that because you were still pretty close to the location. Any, was there anything that proved that he knew anything that was going on, that they were that close to him? No, not to my knowledge. And, and I'm sure we would know about it if it had happened. And then the other question that comes to mind is like you were saying, there's a guy driving down the street with an antenna hanging out of the car in the air. <laughs> Uh -huh. Do you think Pablo had reached a level in, in his, in his mind where he maybe even thought that you guys weren't, you were looking for him, but that he had kind of outsmarted the system? Well, I'm sure he thought he had, you know, he thought he was better than everybody else. He was smarter than everybody else. Um, he had even in these conversations with his son, he's giving him instructions and he tell, he was telling his son, you tell them, if they don't do or print or say what I tell them to say, I'm going to declare a war on Columbia like you've never seen before, which would have been the third time, <laughs> you know, absolutely not something we wanted to see. Right. So, um, he, this is a guy who at one point had as many as 500 Sicarios protecting him. You know, the day he was killed, we all know he had one guy left. I mean, his, his, yeah, his, his financial resources were waning. Uh, his power base was waning. Los Pepe's was uh, take, making huge strides and, and just decimating his organization. The Cali cartel was funding everything. You know, you had Kiko Moncada's wife. Uh, is it Judy Moncada? I think is her first name. She was uh, working with them. There was a guy named Don Berna, who was uh, Diego Murillo is his real name. He was a bodyguard for Kiko Moncada or Fernando Galeano, one or the other. And, you know, of course, they were killed in the prison. And so he joined with Los Pepe's. He was an informant for us at the police base, believe it or not. <clears throat> so this guy shows up and he, and I got to say, man, he's one of the ugliest men I've ever met in my life. He just <laughs> simply is. And I mean, so ugly, he just stands out in your mind. You know, you don't forget the guy. 
and we keep watching him at the base. And finally, we went to Colonel Martinez. We're like, Colonel, who is this guy, man? He looks, something's not right about him. And the Colonel says, hey, Gustavo would agree if the Attorney General said it's okay for us to work for him. You know, he's, he does have good information. So, you know, just be careful around him. Well, it turns out, you know, after the fact, years later, we found out that Don Burner was the head of Los Pepes and, and became uh, the, the biggest drug after, after the Cali cartel was taken down, after the North Valley cartel was taken down. Don Burner was the biggest in Colombia. He ran uh, his cartel or his group was called La Oficina de Envigado, the, the Envigado office. Uh, and he's now doing 30 years here in the United States as well. But uh, um, here's kind of a funny story. <clears throat> we established an 800 number there at the police base for, for Colombians to call in tips. And they want to talk to gringos. You know, they didn't want to talk to the Colombian police. <clears throat> so Javier and I were the guys that talked to him. And the State Department ponied up $5 million as a reward. So we were getting all these tips and sometimes it would be a good enough tip that we felt like we need to go out and meet these people. Well, typically we'd meet them at the bus station, the big bus station in downtown Medellin. It's the largest bus station in the whole country. It's massive. Um, it's like going to Grand Central Station here, you know. Well, when we would go out, we'd send pre-surveillance out to make sure it wasn't a setup because, you know, I mean, you can see me. I'm very, very gringo. I'm, I'm lily white. You know, I still got like a sore thumb down there. There were times when our Dehean guys were out on operations without us. And the only people available was Don Byrne and his guys, his Sicarios. <laughs> now, we didn't know that's who they were. You know, he's been blessed by the attorney general. So you're thinking, well, he might be halfway decent. And you got these murderers protecting you. I'll tell you what, though. When we went to the bus station and other people saw them, they knew who they were. We didn't know who they were. You know, Nobody screwed with us. <laughs> People wouldn't even come around us when they saw those bodyguards. Well, that, but you look back at it now and you're thinking, holy cow, we're just, we're hanging out with these mass murderers and, <laughs> and we don't even know it. And, and, and that's the whole thing. And I, I think that's the difference in, uh, investigations then and investigations now. I mean, think about the difference in knowledge, what you guys, you didn't know what you didn't know. And, right. and all these people are being introduced into you. Today, you could spend 30 minutes looking through the internet and figure out exactly who that guy is. And yeah. so you're, you're counting on these guys, but I'm glad that you brought them up because I told you that I wanted to talk about specific things. And Los Pepes is one. Now, Escobar, from all accounts in the book, thinks that they're in cahoots with you guys, that, that, that the government is actually leading them, that, that the gringos are working with them, all these kind of things out there. I want your honest opinion of what you thought about what they were doing, whether that be good, bad, indifferent, um, and, and what kind of your thoughts on their mission was, because their mission was to knock out Escobar. I mean, really, they were running alongside, just doing it in a different fashion. Right. So, you know, what they did, well, first of all, those puppies, there's nothing glamorous about them. They're vigilantes is exactly what they are. They're mur as murderous, as dangerous as Pablo Escobar ever was. So, <clears throat> um, the cool thing, so, you know, if you're not in law enforcement culture, you might not understand what I'm getting ready to say. The cool thing about this was they took Pablo Escobar's tactics and turned them on him. So Pablo had these leaflets, these little tags that whenever he commit a really heinous crime, they would throw these, these down because they want credit for it. And it was, it said the extraditables, we prefer a tomb in Colombia to a jail cell in the United States. Okay. So that was kind of like their calling card, I guess. <clears throat> so what Los Pepes did is they targeted the entire Medellin cartel organization, but they also targeted anybody that they thought was supporting the Escobars or anybody in the cartel, their families, so it could be school teachers, it could be barbers, beauty shops, uh, you know, restaurants, groceries, uh, lawyers. No, not that that's a bad thing, but uh, that's another story. We <laughs> well, that was later. well. You bring up the lawyers. That was that's an important character in the book, and that's an important story behind Los Pepes. It is. And so, what Los Pepes? Before we get to that, what Los Pepes would do is when they kill these people they had cardboard signs and they would just crudely write on there, you know, compliments of Los Pepes or, you know, Pablo, you're next sign Los Pepes. And, and it was kind of like their calling card. Well, from our standpoint, and, and again, telling the truth, I loved it. I felt like Pablo's getting a taste of his own medicine here. And the general public's reaction 
because of all the indiscriminate bombs and the innocent people that were murdered simply because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, you know, uh, because Pablo had created, had turned Colombia into a narco country, not just a narco state, but a narco country, uh, and the reputation they were getting around the world, they were real happy to see Pablo get it, you know, upside the head every once in a while. Now, when you get to those attorneys, he killed two, the Los Pepes killed two attorneys one day. One of them had his 10 year old son with him and they kill, killed the 10 year old kid in Colombia. It's not like in the United States where they won't post pictures like that in Colombia. They'll put those kind of pictures right in the newspaper and the magazines. I mean, it's, it's blood and guts right there for everybody to see, you know, and here's this poor 10 year old kid with a Los Pepe sign laying on top of him. When that happened, that turned public opinion against Los Pepes and it was gradual. It didn't happen overnight, but it did happen rather quickly, to be honest with you. <clears throat> it got to the point where, um, you know, we didn't have SOCOM special operations command back then we had uh, what controlled the operators in Colombia was uh, Southern command in Panama. So Southern command was calling down wanting the operators out, you know, are you guys complicit? Are you providing information? You know, there's all these accusations and then none of them are true, but you know, I mean, you know how the media is. They'll, they'll try and exploit anything if they think they can get somebody to listen to them. Right. And it was tr true back then. So uh, South command actually ordered the operators out of Colombia. And thank goodness we had an ambassador that had a set of cojones on him because he called the White House and he called the State Department and DOD and got it stopped. Um, now, these guys weren't going out of the base. You know, they were doing, they actually kind of got relegated into a training role where they were training the Columbia National Police. But they were still accessing certain resources and assets that nobody else had access to. And I'm, I'm not going to talk any further about that because it's, I'm not sure if it's still classified, but, you know, uh, I just don't want to talk about that in case it is. I don't want to get in trouble. Right, right. Um, so Javier and I were under the same orders not to leave that base. And he and I talked at the very beginning. We moved up there. It's like, man, we can't do our job. I mean, think about it, DJ. If I come to your city and say, hey, I heard Pablo Escobar's down here at the corner of First of Maine. Go see what you find. I'm going to get a cup of coffee. When you, when you get back, come and report to me. How much respect are you going to – I'll come to Dallas. How much respect are you going to have for me? Right. None. Right. And so we decided right then, you know what? We're going to keep doing our job the way we always do. We were going out on operations. We were jumping on the Huey gunships, going out on raids. We're going out and doing surveillance, uh, meeting informants with the Dehean guys, uh, debriefing informants, uh, you know, all that stuff. And the funny part about that was we'd go back to the embassy and, you know, the bosses, they said, look, you're not supposed to be going out of there. And it was for your own safety. And we understood that. But we just never talked about it. But then when we get ready to go back up to Medellin, they're like, listen, this time when you're up there, go see if you can do this or you can do that, which wasn't in the police base. It was out in the, you know, it's out in the, in the country somewhere where you had to go do things. So they knew exactly what we were doing. We did have, towards the end there, we had uh, two instances where the deputy chief of mission, he's the number two guy in the embassy. He's a career State Department guy, threatens to kick uh, Javier and I out. You know, we'd been to the country team meeting. And when I got up to leave, he's like, Murphy, stay. And so I stayed and he's like, uh, you know, I'm getting information that you're going outside the, the perimeter there at the base on operations. Is that true? And I'm, you know, and I thought I was pretty slick. I said, <clears throat> I said, well, Mr. DCM, you know, we fly into Rio Negro airport and that's outside the city. And so we got, I've got to be outside the police base cause I got to get into the police base. So sometimes it's by car, sometimes by helicopter. So yeah, I'm, I'm outside the base. He's like, you smart ass. That's not at all what I'm asking you. You know exactly what I'm asking you. And, you know, and, and the second time it happened, he said, I warned you once before, this is your last warning. You do it again, and I find out about it, you and your partner will be on the next American Airlines flight to the United States, and which there was one flight a day, and that was like 7 a.m. every morning. <coughs> so it didn't slow us down. You know, we kept going. Now, I will say that when the day that Escobar was killed and um, after the operation went down, I was in Colonel Martinez's office, and, and I was, you know, we were mounting up the search block to go out and support the guys. And it takes a while to get 600 guys, you know, loaded up and assignments and weapons and accountability and all that stuff. So I run over to the barracks and I grab my weapons and my camera. I always had a camera with me. <laughs> I'm and, so uh, you would say this. Oh, man. So I run in, the, <laughs> uh, run in the wire room and get on the phone and call the embassy because I want to call our boss, Joe Toft. And so I can't get through. So finally I call the admin office because, you know, back then Javier was dating the admin officer. So we got a lot of preferential treatment <laughs> in that office. So you got to use your connections, right? <laughs> so 
uh, this young girl named Angie answers the phone. I said, she's like, Hey, how you doing? And I said, get Mr. Toff on the phone. Now this is an emergency. Okay. 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 Hold on. And I'm on the phone. It seems like for three days. And finally, I mean, it's just taking forever. And I know they're launching the operation out there, you know, and, uh, and finally Mr. Toff gets up the phone. And the first thing he said is they just killed Pablo. I'm like, well, son of a bitch. That's why I was calling you to tell you. <laughs> I said, how'd you find out the current, the general in charge of the Columbia national police, Joe Toft is one of the first people he called, not the president of Columbia. He called Joe and told him, and I'm sure it was a five second phone call just to say, this is what happened, you know? But, um, so he said, well, listen, you get your butt out there and you confirm that's Pablo Escobar. That's your mission today. And I said, Joe, you know, well, I call him Mr. Toft back then. I said, Mr. Toft, you know what the DCM, he's already threatened to kick me out of the country twice. If I go back outside the perimeter, he's get your ass out there and do your job. I said, that's what I want to hear boss. So I, you know, I've got my gear. I go running out to the quad. It's me and the gate guards. Everybody, every 600, every single one of those 600 guys is gone. There's not a single vehicle in the compound. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't even know where the heck they are. You know? And so I'm, I'm, all these scenarios are starting. I'm thinking, well, did they, you know, can I call a tax cab? I don't even know, to, know where to tell him to go, you know, and, and I, I'm looking for anybody. <laughs> and let's, thank the good Lord, here comes a Jeep driving back in, and it's Colonel Martinez with his protection detail. And he looks over at me, he's like, Steve, Cabasa, you know, Steve, what are you doing? Uh, Steve, what are you doing? And I, I said, Colonel, I need to ride out to the site. I heard you just killed Pablo. And he's like, well, why aren't you in the trucks? And I said, well, I had to call the boss back in Bogotá. And he's like, get your ass in the Jeep. Run out of here with me. So I did. I rode over the scene with, with uh, Colonel Martinez. And it was, it was a feeling of jubilation. I mean, we had had false alerts before. And so you kind of go out with a little hesitancy about getting excited because you want to know, is this Pablo Escobar? <coughs> so I get there. I stick with Colonel Martinez. That way I can get access to everything. We go into this three floor, three story row house. We get up to the, <clears throat> excuse me. We get up to the third floor and there's the window that Pablo jumped out of that landed him on the, the roof of the two story row house behind him. And there's his body and there's all our Daheen buddies. And I, I go, yo, and they look around and they're like, stick, stick. And they're rolling their rifles up. And some of them start firing rounds up in the air. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's crazy. And so I, I would yell at them and say, you know, uh, photograph here. And, and they would all get together, you know, and they'd hold their rifles up and they actually confiscated all those pictures from me. So we never got those back. Well, um, let, let's but, talk about that in a minute because that's pretty okay. interesting. Yeah. Why that happened and how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a story. <laughs> you want me to tell it now? Uh, yeah. You know what? Well, I, what I want to point out real quick is Toff. There was a reason that you were trying to get to Toff so quickly, and it wasn't because you were trying to win kudos with him. Toff had a big thing about he wanted the information before anyone else had it, and he didn't give a shit who brought it to him, whether it was an informant in the street, whether it was you. The only caveat to that was it better be you before them, even though he would hear it. So that's why you were rushing to get the information to him. It was, and on top of that, you know, we had a, our first line supervisor was a group supervisor and we had an assistant special agent in charge. And then you had Joe, who was the country out of Shea. He was the big boss. <coughs> our, our group supervisor, we called him lying on us, uh, to Mr. Toff to save his own butt a couple of times. So we got to the point where we didn't even go to him. And the ASAC was usually so busy taking care of all the other stuff. And he was a good friend of mine. Um, but you couldn't always get access to him. So we got to the point where Javier and I would just go to Mr. Toff direct. You know, and, and we're quasi-military, just like every, every other police agency, and you're supposed to follow your chain of command. Of course. But this was such a high priority, we never caught any grief over that. So not only did I want to be the first to get that information to Mr. Toff, because I didn't want to get my butt chewed, but the other thing was I had that much respect for him, that I, and he had gone to bat for us over and over and over again. He's one of the hardest men I've ever worked for. Uh, I got two butt chewings from him. I didn't deserve either one of them. He apologized later. Uh, for both of them. Um, but I still respected the man and, and I felt like he needed to know, you know, cause I know he's going to be on the, on the hook with Washington. He got to call them and fill them in and they're going to, they're going to ask a bazillion questions. You know, it's just, that's just the way we are. I mean, heck, we're, you know, we're investigators. And when somebody tells you something, you want to know all the facts that you can possibly get out of it. Right. So that's, that had a lot to do. I called Joe and, uh, he just, he had more, a lot more time in country than I did. 
he had dedicated his life to DEA down there. I mean, his whole lifestyle's uh, pretty much centered around DEA and, and then captured Pablo. And you know what, when the, when the shit would hit the fan, he had her backs. Well, when you awesome. go there and, 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 you know, after all that happens, I just wanted to explain about Toft because Toft is a pretty important, uh, storyline in the book. Um, for all those reasons that you just said, um, when you get there and you take pictures, you said it was good that you went there to take pictures. You felt bad that Javier was in the United States, but if Javier would have been there, he never carried a camera with him. So the photos that you took, um, might not be around or, or wouldn't be around because he didn't carry a camera with him. Now I thought it was interesting that you go around and you take all these pictures, you take them in the row house, you take them on the rooftop where Pablo is, uh, over where Lamone is, all these different things, and, and, and you get all of this evidence. And there were two things that, that stood out to me. One was no other camera worked out there. Now, that sounded a little shady to me that no other camera worked out there. But then they ask you for yours, and they wanted not only your film, but they wanted the negatives, all that kind of stuff. They said, if you give it to us, we'll print it out. We'll give you whatever copies you want, and we'll give you your negatives back. That didn't happen. Yeah, not, not completely. Um, <clears throat> there was a Lieutenant Colonel there, uh, Norberto Polias, who was a really good friend of ours. Had been through the FBI National Academy, uh, spoke passable English. He was just a really nice guy, but he's also extremely intelligent. And he's the guy that came to me and, and said, Hey, you know, none of our cameras worked out there. Can we get your film? And I think I had, I don't remember if it was three rolls or five rolls. I want to say it was five rolls. It might only have been three, but anyway. I think you said <clears> in said, the book. We, I think you said three in the book. Okay. And okay, so that's what it was. He said, look, we'll take this, have it developed. We'll give you the negatives back, and I'll give you as many copies of every picture as you want. I'll have them printed out as we have ours printed out. And I said, I'd like to have five copies of each and agreed to it. I mean, what am I going to say? You know, I mean, I'm in their country. and Absolutely. They've just pulled off the biggest law enforcement operation in the history of their country and, and one of the biggest in, ever in the world. And I couldn't say no to them. Absolutely. And uh, so when, you know, a few hours go by and there was this one major <clears throat> that had a Napoleon complex, you know, a little short guy wanted to be a tough guy. Uh, all he did is run his mouth, a little bit skinny for it. I mean, you could just blow on him and he just about fall down, but man, he would run his mouth all the time and he wasn't pro gringo. And um, so I saw him coming across with the bags from the Photoshop <clears throat> and he's coming back into the barracks where we, you know, we were staying in the officer's barracks which, you know, sounds good, but uh, let me tell you, I, I've had as many, I've slept as, with many, as many as eight people in one room that's designed for two, and, and we were all in bunk beds, and you share a bathroom with eight other guys in a, an adjacent bedroom, and there's no hot water, you know, there's Up, nothing glamorous about above it Above the kitchen that starts cooking at 3.30 yeah. in the morning. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, I see him coming in and I'm like, Hey major, I need to get those pictures from you. And, and he just won't even, it's almost like he elbows you as he goes by, he's not going to give me the time of day. And he goes into a room and slams the door. So I'm, I wait a little while and I, I don't get anything. I go knock on the door and one of the captains comes to the door who was a friend. And I said, Hey, Kevin, I, you know, I need the photographs. He's like, yeah, we're working on a stick. You know, it's going to be a little while. And, you know, and he's kind of looking like, you know, the guy outranks me. I can't override him. So I just went back to Colonel Polias and I said, Colonel, here was our agreement. And, you know, whistle dick in there has got the photographs and won't give them to me. You know, I've got bosses just like you do. I've got to take these back to Bogota. And uh, he's like, okay, I'll take care of it. So probably within, I don't know, maybe an hour or so, there's a knock on my barracks door and it's the Colonel. And he hands me a bag with the negatives and the five copies of the pictures. So I start going through them and, you know, and, and I'm thanking him cause he was such a nice guy. I mean, just, I had a lot of respect for Colonel Polias and I'm going through the pictures and all the pictures of the Dahin guys on that roof were, were missing, including the negatives. So I, I knew, you know, I, I ran into the, the major later and I said, you know, what happened with all the pictures? He said, you don't have any right to those. You know, this is all in Spanish. You don't have any right to all those pictures. You could get us killed with these pictures. People don't need to know who we are. You know, and that's kind of hard to argue with. But then when they publish their own pictures <laughs> <laughs> on the front of Savannah Magazine, which is like Newsweek here in the United States, I'm like, dude, you know, I know you're just screwing over me because I'm a gringo, but 
eh, you know, we got through it. So just one of those things. One other interesting thing that I thought before we get into what you're doing now and stuff, uh, a really important thing was in the book, you go back and forth with you and Javier explaining both of your sides of the story. But I think the the best part of the entire book is at the end when you both are explaining how you feel when it's over. And, and Javier says an interesting thing, and I would like to ask him whenever I finally do get to talk to him. Um, he said that he was elated that it happened. I, I think that's the word he used, elated, or he's very happy that Pablo was killed. But he was also very angry that he was in the United States. I want to know your feelings on the situation. Of course, you were elated that it was happening, but you spend all this time, what, 18 months looking for him. You, you, you know, been through a ton. And then the operation happens while you're asleep. You wake up to it being over. That's got to weigh on you a little bit. So I want to get your true feelings on how you felt when this was all over. Um, the feeling of elation was there. Um, honestly, it felt like the weight of the world was lifted off our shoulders. You know, <clears throat> we haven't had a day off, and I don't remember how long. You're working... Um, <sighs> Even when you're in Bogota, you were working so many hours in the embassy because you had to be on top of everything. Um, and you didn't have any other responsibilities, but you know, you got people wanting to come in and give information. So you have to go meet them. So you're getting in the embassy, maybe six, seven o'clock in the morning. And you're lucky if you're home by midnight, you're living, literally living on coffee and donuts, uh, down there just, you know, cause they always had, somebody always had donuts and I'm a cop. I like donuts. Right. And they were free. So, um, you're eating crap food, right? You know, I'm barely getting to see Connie any at all. There's times, there was one time when I was in Medellin for five weeks straight and didn't get to see her for five weeks because Javier had, had, uh, <clears throat> something came up and then he ended up taking a week or two of vacation and, and he hadn't had vacation in like a couple of years. So <clears throat> the cool thing was though, they, they had the nurses station in the embassy and I'd stop by and have my blood pressure checked Cause I knew I was eating like crap and I wasn't sleeping properly. And, uh, my blood pressure was always normal. It never, never went up, even under all that stress. Right. So uh, you were lucky if you got to go home and shower and take maybe a four hour nap and then right back at it. And then in Medellin, almost every day you're going out on operations, whether it's and by the helicopter. Sometimes they take you on helicopters and drop you off. We'd have a 60 man patrol and you go hump the mountains for all freaking day. And the food you had was what you took with you. Right. I don't know if you've ever had USMREs, you know, when I, when I was a kid, my, I had an uncle was in the air force and he'd bring them to me and they tasted like crap, but you know, they were MREs and you thought that was cool. I, you know, I, it's funny cause, uh, I've said it on here before. I actually love MREs. Well, the, the more recent ones are a lot better tasting, <laughs> but you want to taste a crappy MRE, try a Colombian MRE, <laughs> you know, and, and for your listeners, we're talking about meals ready to eat. This is what you eat in the field. The only thing that was worth a hoot in it was a packet of cocoa powder that you can make like chocolate water or chocolate milk if you could get a hold of chocolate milk. But it, when you're out on these foot patrols, you're always like this one time we set up base at a, a schoolhouse and this is a mountain schoolhouse. The kids would show it's cold. It was cold in the mountains. They'd show up with these raggy t-shirts, shorts, and, and uh, rubber boots on, you know, and, and they weren't shivering, you know, they just, they're from very poor families I would videotape them on, a, I had a video camera with me, so I'd videotape them. And then a, the big thing was I'd let them watch it back on the screen because they'd never seen television. They'd never seen themselves on camera. But, you know, you gave, you always gave your chocolate powder to the kids because they never got stuff like that. Right. <coughs> so those, those MREs make you want US MREs. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only the MREs, but you also had the rice and chicken almost every day. Rice, oh, potatoes, God. and chicken with, uh, uh, I guess it was like boiled chicken. Um, oh, it's nasty. It's nasty. But, but it, you know, it, it, uh, definitely, um, it definitely brought you closer with who you were working with because they saw that you guys weren't above doing what they were doing. And that's how you get along. I mean, you know, we, we, Javier and I said at the very beginning, when we decided we were going to go out of the base on operations, we're going to, we're going to work like they do. We're going to face some of the same dangers they do, not nearly as many as they did. We're going to live in the same conditions. We're going to eat the same food. If we can catch them back in Bogota or, or even, you know, occasionally we'd go out to a bar. Uh, sometimes we just go out and get burgers and beers there. There was a, at the base, there was an inner perimeter and outer perimeter. So the inner perimeter was only police. 
the outer perimeter was that that section in between there were actually Colombians living in it you know so there was little restaurants and and places like that and there were ice cream shops and you could go get uh, you know good a pretty decent hamburger and a couple of beers or aguardiente or what other nasty spirits you want to drink <laughs> You know, I mean, you had to, it was a way of releasing the tension and the stress at times. A absolutely. And, and not to mention the, the weekend parties when you're back in Bogota, um, people oh, seem to have yeah. a great time at those. So <sighs> as Pablo's done, I, I'm, I'm taking from what you're saying is yes, there's elation, but it's also kind of, you can breathe for the first time in 18 months. You felt like that you could, you honestly, and I, <laughs> I don't mean this to sound like uh, I, we certainly don't subscribe to the theory that we're any kind of heroes. We were just cops doing our job. You know, our, our job just happened to be a little bit different than what, you know, most cops go through during that time. But <clears throat> you felt like every citizen in the country of Columbia was safe. As soon as Pablo Escobar died, the bombing stopped, the indiscriminate killings, the contracts, the Sicarios, his organization was decimated. You know, people ask us now, don't we worry about our safety traveling around the world? And we don't because we took out the entire organization. There was one guy left that, you know, his nickname was Popeye. Um, he was out. He just died last year, I think it was, from cancer. But he, when he got out of prison, he he got his own Netflix show. He wrote a book. I mean, he was doing better than we were <laughs> in the media, you know. And uh, this guy is a stone cold murderer. He's on... He's on one of the documentaries and I can't, I think it's discovery, but I'm not sure. And I think it's the one called facing Escobar. We've done, I bet we've probably done 12, 15 different documentaries and they, they all kind of run together. But, um, Javier and I had flown up to, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia to meet with the producers up there. And, you know, we're helping them plot out the show and who's going to talk about what and everything. And they brought up Popeye and we told him, don't talk to him. He's a stone cold murderer. And Javier and I, had, and I had attributed about ten to 15,000 murders to Pablo Escobar. Oh, well, of course, the producers, they went not, and, you know, they didn't listen to us. They went and interviewed Popeye because they knew he'd be a big draw to the show. And he says, yeah, he said, the gringos, you know, they say Pablo killed ten to 15,000. It's more like 50,000 people. And on this, on this documentary, Popeye admits to killing as many as 300 people himself under orders of Pablo Escobar. And he admits on camera to planning the murders of as many as 3000 people. I mean, these guys are mass murderers. Holy cow. So that's why we, you know, we don't worry about our safety too much. We're not stupid. We don't do, we don't go out that much to be quite honest with you. And, and when you're on a tour, you know, like we went and did a Northern Scandinavian, Northern European tour, we did 12 shows in 13 days. All you're doing is sleeping in a hotel, going to an airport, doing a show, sleeping in a hotel, going to the airport. You don't get to sightsee. You don't get to go out to good restaurants. You know, by the time that 12th show runs, we stopped in Iceland on the way back in Reykjavik and did a show there. And we were dragging. I mean, it, it was a little bit tougher than we thought it was going to be. At least there was no, you know, rice, potatoes, and chicken. So you, yeah. you've got that in your favor. So let's talk about that. You're talking about the tour and everything. Your life's kind of changed. <clears throat> and I think that started in like 2013 was when Netflix approached you, correct? It was. And that's, uh, they called me in February, Eric Newman. He's the creator of Narcos, executive producer. I turned him down on the phone. I think he fell out of his chair. Because <laughs> we've since found out that people sell their soul in Hollywood to be on TV. Um in March, he flew to Washington with two writers. I had dinner with him. Um, and I'm running everything by Javier. He's on board with everything. And, and our personalities all clicked. And uh, at the end of the night, he said, well, what are you going to do? You know, what, what are you, what are you going to do next? And I said, well, I'll talk to Javier, but I'm going to recommend that we follow up with you guys and let's just see where this goes. And, and as we're walking down the door, he said, why are you guys so hesitant to tell your story? <clears throat> and we were just real honest with him. I said, Eric, the last thing we want is anybody would ever glorify a mass murderer like Pablo Escobar. And Eric promised me that night. He said, I promise you, we will never do that. We will never glorify Pablo Escobar in this series. And you know what? The man has lived up to his word. Uh, you, you know, I, I'm impressed by it. Uh, you know, you always hear bad things coming out of Hollywood, but Eric Newman in my books, you know, he, he's a man of his word. I really respect that guy. Well, let's talk about the show for a minute. Um, of course they add Hollywood elements. We've talked about that a little during, during our conversation. And, and of course they add the Hollywood element to it. 
Are you happy with what they've done? Do you think that they have given the proper, um, proper respect that's due to not only you, but to everyone that was involved because you give credit over and over and over in the book to the CNP, to, uh, all the people that you worked with, to the Colombian military, you give credit out. Do you think that they have covered all that? And do you think that they've given it in every form and fashion, the proper respect that it was due? I think they created a hell of a series. You know, it's, um, <clears throat> we estimate that about a third of what you see is true. A third of it's kind of true. And a third of it's just straight out of Hollywood. You know, Javier and I were not running across those rooftops unilaterally in shootouts. We were always with the Columbia National Police. We never did anything on our own. Um, and there's, I mean, there's a hundred different things that they put in there that I could tell you about that's not true. Um, I don't like the fact that they showed me on the roof there when Pablo was killed because that's not true. I mean, this was a Colombian National Police operation, and that's, till the day we die, that's our one message to the world is, if you don't remember anything else we say, just remember the true heroes were the Colombian National Police because they took their country back from this guy. You know, and that's just, that's as simple as it gets. Um, <clears throat> almost every, we encourage audiences to go visit Columbia. It's a beautiful place. Uh, you go in the big cities, it's just like the United States. There's parts of, of the big cities. There's parts in Orlando I'm not going to go to because they're dangerous. I'm going to get mugged. Same thing in Columbia. Just stay in the nicer areas and you're not going to have any problems. Uh, you got to recognize that you're in a different culture and you need to not be the ugly American, you know, accept that, that you're in a different world and just try and get along. It's, I promise you the Colombians will work with you. They're, they are fantastic people. And so the reason I'm saying all that is Javier and I have done, I'm going to guess, four to 500 shows over the past six years. <coughs> COVID, COVID really killed us. We had an 80% reduction in, in business because of COVID. And it, we're just now starting to kick back up uh, with speaking events in person. We do a lot of virtual stuff, but we also do a few in-person things now also. Um, uh, and I just lost my train of thought there. So, so we've done all these shows, every audience, well, not every, but almost every audience we speak to, there are Colombians in the audience and they'll wait for us, especially if it's an in-person show, they'll wait for us after the show. And they'll come to you to say, thank you for what you did for my country. And thank you for what you said about my country, because everybody thinks we're nothing but narco traffickers down there. So it's, um, <clears throat> I've met people's parents who grow up, grew up, uh, in the Escobar heyday. I've met people the, we just had a new roof pole in this house when we built it. I mean, when we bought it and the roofer is Medellin by birth. Now he grew up here in, in Orlando, you know, and he, I mean, he talks better English than I do, but his grandfather was kidnapped twice in class. Dad, his grandfather was very well to do in Columbia. He was kidnapped once by the narcos and once by the FARC, both times for a ransom and they didn't hurt him. Thank God. But, you know, that, that way of life down there, Columbia has an extremely violent history. It has the longest running civil war in the history of the entire world. I mean, they're, they're right at 60 years that they've been fighting the civil war down there. They've even got a, a period of their history. They call La Violencia, the violent time. And it's, it's just, you got to read about it. It's the, the violence that's going on. These bands would come into these little small pueblos, these little towns, and they kick people's doors in the middle of the night while they're sleeping and use machetes and, you know, chop their heads off, chop their hands off. It was just an extremely violent place, but it's also one of the most beautiful countries I've ever visited. And I've, you know, Javier and I have been around the world a couple of times now. It's just really is a beautiful place. Well, one other question about the show, when you mention like the rooftop, so how do you deal with something like that? Do you, do you tell the producers? Do you, I mean, because you've been very forward with them about telling them how you want to be portrayed, how you want the CMP to be portrayed. When something like that happens, uh, how do you deal with it? Well, your contract <laughs> that you signed uh, says that they can employ literary licensing as they see fit, which means they can do whatever the heck they want to do. Uh, it's funny, even in, in uh, season two, if you remember <clears throat> where they show Javier passing classified information to Los Pepe's. Okay. Now, that's not true. That's Hollywood. But it made for a great storyline. But when they wrote that scene, you know, we'd already signed the contracts. We were paid consultants for the first two seasons. Uh, we'd fly out to Hollywood and meet with the writers a week at a time. And then we'd spend a lot of time on the phone and email with them and things like that. And 
the writers are phenomenal. I mean, they're extremely intelligent, very, very well read. Uh, the first time Harvey and I went out to Hollywood, their library, I, they had books in there I've never even heard of, you know, about Pablo Escobar and all the drug cartels and stuff like that. So really cool people. Um, but when they wrote that in there, the script about Javier passing classified information to Los Pepe's, Eric called Javier and talked to him about it. He says, look, we're, we're really going to make your character look bad. You know, but I mean, we know you're not, we know you didn't cooperate with Los Pepe's. And so, you know, they kind of explained to Javier and, and Eric said, well, listen, we're going to fax you a piece of paper. If you would just do me a favor and sign it, send it back to us. <laughs> <laughs> and if Javier's here, he'll tell you the same thing. He said, you know, what that paper was, was him releasing them from mm -hmm. suing them because they were, you know, they were going to assassinate his character. I mean, they were really making him look like he'd gone to the dark side. Absolutely. And his response during every show we do is, hey, you know what? I was making money. I didn't give a shit. I've signed that bullshit piece of paper. <laughs> Sorry for the language, but that's no, no, that, that's uh, believe me, everyone's heard it. So, show out of the way. We've talked about the tour. Let's talk about Game of Crimes real quick. Um, oh, yeah. And and that that seems to be taken off too. I mean, you're recording tons of episodes, so let's talk about it. Man, you know, I mean, our first time we went to Australia, and New Zealand, we had a tour manager because uh, Live Nation brought us over, and we had an agent here in the United States that was our representative. And so when you go on these foreign tours, they give you a tour manager, which is like a babysitter. And it was this lady named Charney and she's been our tour manager. Both times we've been through Australia and New Zealand. We've done two tours over there. She's phenomenal. You know, <clears throat> she's helping us two little redneck country boys. She, she's been the tour manager for, you know, um, Taylor Swift for ACDC. I mean, the big names, you know, she's worked with them and here she's taking care of Javier and Steve. I love her to death. You know, she's still a friend. We stay in touch on, uh, on social media and everything. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, the first time we went over there, she told, she said, you guys need to look at doing a blog, a podcast. And I'm like, I don't even know what that stuff is. She's like, well, are you on social media? And I said, well, I think we have Facebook and she's the one that signed us up on Instagram and Twitter while we were in Australia the first time. I mean, she's just really squared away. So, <clears throat> um, um, and again, I just lost my train of thought. It's getting past my bedtime here. Oh, so, so when we finally got around and Javier wasn't interested in doing a podcast, I didn't know a lot about it. And, and we kind of talked about it for a few years. And finally I met a guy named Morgan Wright and Morgan's a former Kansas state trooper. And he was a detective in Celine, I think, uh, Kansas or one of those agencies out there. And he's now a world recognized cybersecurity expert. And we, turns out we were neighbors. And so, Somebody introduced me to him to help him out with the thing, and, and I did, and we got to be friends. And as our friendship grew, we started talking about a podcast, and so we came up with the idea. <clears throat> so, you know, we're all, Javier, I, and, and Morgan are all three represented by United Talent Agency uh, for film work. Uh, didn't even know they had a podcast section, but they represent us on our podcast. They're our agent for that. And they found us a network. We're with uh, Upside Down Digital Media, um, and that opened a lot of doors. And so our idea for a podcast was um, a guest on each show, mostly good guys, but occasionally bad guy. Um, it, it's long form, meaning that it can go for hours and hours. You know, uh, we recorded one today that lasted four hours. It comes out next week. Wow. Um, I think the longest I've done is like three and a half. Oh, it's a long time, isn't it? When, you know, we, when we interviewed Dave Reichert from the uh, Green River serial murder case, mm -hmm. yeah, five hours, five hours wow. sitting in the chair with Dave. And he was gracious enough to give us all that time. And then, you know, like our first bad guy, if you remember the movie Blow with Johnny Depp, mm -hmm. where he portrays a guy named George Jung, we've had George Jung on the show. Now, George, we, we recorded him in the spring, thank goodness, because he passed away in May. And he's, I think he was 77 years old. So we got his last recorded interview. Uh, we just recorded, just in fact, is out this week, a guy named Luis Navia, who was 25 years in the narcotics business, Cuban-American, got tied in with the Colombian cartels, you know, worked with Pablo and Kiko Moncada and Fernando Galeano, and Mickey Ramirez, a bunch of those guys. You know, I mean, the, these are real bad guys. Uh, worked with El Chapo before he became El Chapo. Um, got caught. He was indicted in the United States with under 4,600 kilos of cocaine. When they arrested him in Venezuela, the DEA agent that went down there, Eric Kolbinski, a good friend of mine from Miami days, um, they seized 25 tons that they were moving out of Venezuela to Europe. 
25 tons of coke. <laughs> Unbelievable. So his story's out this week. Uh, and when we do these long shows, we divide into two parts. So the first half drops on Monday morning, the second on Thursday morning. So you hear it in the same week. But uh, the numbers are better than anybody expected them to be. Uh, you know, there was a group on Facebook that started a fan page before we even launched our first uh, episode. Uh, those people are a hoot, man. They're a lot of fun, uh, a lot of cut-ups. They will bust your chops. You know, you can't have thin skin with these people, but right. they're a lot of fun. Um, you know, we, we now have Patreon, so we've got uh, subscriber bases better than I, thought I ever thought it would be. I'll be honest with you. Uh, we've got merchandise now. We're we're talking to Upside Down Digital Media about maybe doing some in-person shows and things like that. So um, all of this stuff is the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing in retirement. You know, I was a cop for 38 years. I really don't know how to do anything else. This is, I'm learning as I go here. It's like on the job training, but I got to tell you, DJ, I am having a blast. I never thought retirement would be this much fun. You know, we've told this story. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times. And, you know, we find somebody like you and you actually are well read. You read the book and you know what you're talking about. You make it exciting for us to tell the story again. So it's, it's, uh, people say, well, don't you get bored with it? And how do you remember what you're supposed to say? <laughs> well, when you tell the truth, yeah. the story never changes, right? It's just yeah. one story. So, so the big thing, you know, and, and it's funny that you say that because you have, you know, the good guys and then some bad guys. I've had a couple people approach me and say, you should have on some guys. And, I, and I'm I'm still in that law enforcement mode where I really have trouble. Um, one that's been mentioned to me a ton of times is Mike Dowd. And I don't know if you know who that is, but uh, the name's familiar. 75th precinct in New York. They say he was the most corrupt cop ever in America. There's a documentary on him. I mean, they stole millions, <coughs> millions and millions of dollars and helped out. As a matter of fact, when he got out of prison, uh, he went into business with the Dominican drug guy that he was doing. They own a cigar company now in the Dominican Republic. So it's a it's a very exciting story, amazing story. But I'm just having trouble going, you know, I, I would have trouble talking to this guy because yeah. he, he is almost the exact opposite. Uh, not even almost. He is the exact opposite of what we have, you right. know, dedicated the life to. Absolutely. I don't think I could interview a corrupt cop. I'll, I'll be the first to say no, nobody hates a bad cop worse than a good cop. Absolutely. And, I, and <clears throat> you make that conscious decision to go to the dark side. I got no, nothing to do with you anymore. It's, uh, um, but it's, you know, it is fun talking to these bad guys and these, the guys we interview have all cooperated with law enforcement. They've done their time, right. you know, they've paid their debt to society. Uh, like the guy that's up this week, Luis Navia, he's got a book out called pure narco, um, he was never violent, never carried a weapon. He was kidnapped three different times. Uh, hearing his story, I know one of the guys that kidnapped him, the guy that was in charge of the North Valley cartel, they call him Rascuño. Rascuño was known to be one of the most violent drug traffickers in all of Colombia. Never, you got kidnapped by him. He never let anybody go. To my knowledge, Luis Navi is the only guy he ever let go. You that know, that and, would and be was, an interesting story of how he got away. Yeah. You know, hey, tune in. Game of crimes. There you go. <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. So I'm sure they can find it on all podcasts, uh, it's all on podcasts, every like channel. Spotify, Apple, all those. Now, is that also a video version? No, only audio. Okay. Um, we, you know, at some point we hope to go to video, but you know, everybody keeps telling me I got a face for radio, so I'm not sure what the hell that means, but we'll see. <laughs> it's not good. I think it's I'm got telling something to do with that. the light reflecting, the light <laughs> reflecting on my bald head here or something, you know? So, uh, other than all this, what's next for you, man? Well, um, a lot of this isn't known. Some of it is. Oh, uh, good. I'm Exclusives. I, well, I, we've told maybe two or three other podcasts this. We're uh, negotiating a television series um, that would be like a look inside the real DEA. Uh, we have agreements in place. We have a production company. We have a network right now that's interested. So, we're pursuing that. I can't tell you more than that right now. Um, just cause you sign all these non-disclosure agreements. Good Lord. Right. Afraid somebody steal your idea. And, and you know what? They know more about the business than I do. So we, we participate. Uh, Javier and I, are, and I are also working on a different podcast that would be a limited series, um, with a topic that involves Colombians that has never been addressed. And I'm not going to tell you more than that <laughs> cause again, non-disclosure agreements. It's looking really good. We're hoping, um, 
uh, we've got some phenomenal people lined up to interview on that. So we're hoping that comes through. It's looking really good. And then he and I are the lead investigators on a, on a group that we work with called the Lost Clipper Project. And if you go on our website, you can see a link on it there. You can go to it and in the Reader's Digest version. In 1938, 15 Americans aboard a Pan Am Hawaiian Clipper, a Clipper was a four engine seagoing plane, uh, were just disappeared in 1938. <clears throat> Our theory is that the, the plane had to island hop because it didn't have the fuel capacity to go from San Francisco to Shanghai, I think is, was its ultimate destination. So it had to island hop. Well, there's reports that when they left uh, Guam, I think it was, that the, when the plane took off, it looked like it was tail heavy. When it hit the point of no return, our theory is that the two Japanese spies that had hidden themselves in the back of this plane, and these are massive, plant, bigger than you planes we see today, um, had hit, had secreted themselves in the back, came out with revolvers, skyjacked the plane, and forced them to land in Truck Lagoon over Micronesia. Now, if you know anything about Truck Lagoon, that was the Japanese Pearl Harbor. Okay, Admiral Yamamoto, that's where his headquarters were. Truck Lagoon is... is uh, dubbed as the best wreck diving site in the world because there's so many ships and planes that have been sunk there. <coughs> what our theory is, is that they took the 15 Americans off and murdered them on the island of, of uh, Tonawas, which is part of the country of Chuk, C-H-U-K. Then the Japanese flew the Hawaiian Clipper onto Japan where they reverse engineered the motors on the, on the plane because it was the latest technology in aviation. And those reverse engineered engines are what the Japanese put on their zero fighters. So that was the theory. Um, more recently, we have uncovered information that one of the passengers on the plane was an Asian businessman from Newark, New Jersey, he owned three Chinese restaurants in Newark. He was carrying $3 million in what we would call bearer notes today. So if you're holding this piece of paper, that's as good as cash. Um, he says he raised that money from fundraisers at his three Chinese restaurants in Newark, New Jersey during the depression. That makes sounds, absolutely no sense. Yeah, that sounds a little crazy. Yeah. So his story was that he was going to take that money and give it to Shane Kai check because the Chinese were in war against the Japanese and $3 million would buy 50 American fighters and a year's worth of maintenance. Our theory is, that he was going to use that $3 million to give to the Japanese as ransom to get Amelia Earhart back who disappeared in 1937. So <clears throat> I went over before COVID. So it's been two or three years ago. I went over with the, the investigative team. It was my first trip. It was their fourth trip searching for the 15 bodies. We took ground penetrating radar. We thought we actually found them the first day and it turned out just to be anomalies underground. So we were there for two weeks searching you're searching on an island that's inhabited, but there's no electricity, no running water. Um, it was a real adventure. I got to tell you, man, we were staying over in Chuk and it, we'd have to get on these two boats and ride 45 minutes to get to the island of Tonawas. So we're ready to go back for our fifth trip, their fifth trip, my second trip. And this time we're taking cadaver dogs. We brought a, uh, a guy named Jim Janicki on the team. Jim is a chemist by profession and a scientist, uh, extremely intelligent. He has reviewed all the information available and he thinks he has the exact location of where the bodies are buried down to with like just a meter or two margin of error. And these the cadaver dogs are good enough that they can still buy, find bodies, you know, all these, what, 80 something years later. So if we can prove all this, <laughs> I'm looking at this as an adventure. I'm having a blast doing this. You know, I'm going to the South Pacific. Holy cow. I'd never get to do that. Well, and, uh, so if we can prove this, the first skyjacking in the history of the world will be the Hawaiian Clipper, not whatever it was now. The first act of war against the United States by the Japanese will not be Pearl Harbor. It'll be the skyjacking of the Pan Am Clipper because there were military officers on that plane and they used them for war purposes. We may finally bring closure to the murder of 15 Americans for their families. And we've got a chance at solving the Amelia Earhart mystery. I mean, this is a lot of it's pie in the sky, but a lot of it's not either. I mean, this is, this is pretty cool. So, uh, I just, I look at life as an adventure. Um, people think I'm crazy, you know, for going out and hanging out in the jungles of, of Micronesia for two weeks, but I loved it. Oh, it was just a blast. Well, I mean, I don't know that you could get much bigger now, but let's say you solve two of those four things. I, <laughs> I, it, you know, 
have you thought about running for president? Uh, oh no! Yeah. I, well, my wife says she said, "Well, oh, your personality." When I start talking, she's like, "Oh, he's running for mayor again." That's what she tells the kids. <laughs> Where's dad? Oh, he's over running for mayor. <laughs> I'm not running for mayor. I'm just a nice guy. <laughs> Man, yeah. I, I'm so happy that you came on. I'm so glad that we got to talk. It's a fantastic it's book. I want to go over everywhere that people can find you. First off, go to www.deanarcos.com. That's the big place where they can find almost everything. You can order the book. You can find out about the show. You can find out about the tours. Everything is there. Once again, that's deanarcos.com. If you want them on Instagram, you can find them at DEA Narcos. If you want them on Facebook, you can see them on DEA Narcos. Now, the difference in that one is, is that the DEA is capitalized. Narcos is undercased. And then, of course, on YouTube, DEA Narcos. Once again, the DEA is capitalized and the Narcos is undercase. Uh once again, you can find out everything, even more about their story. You can look at pictures from everything that they were doing and get more of an inside look than just seeing the show on there. Also, guys, check out the book because it is absolutely fantastic. Manhunters, how we took down Pablo Escobar. If you can, uh, I think it gives it a good touch, too, as well as it's written uh, to hear it in the audio version. It's, it's very good, too two different voices are doing the two different people and it really brings the stories to life. So if you want to check them out, once again, go to deanarcos.com. If you want more of me, you can find me on Instagram at DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast, and you can find me on YouTube where all of these conversations are video recorded. You get to see Steve's face for radio. You get to see my face every week, and it gives you a different look at these stories than just the podcast will. You'll get to see some photos. You'll get to see some different things that we're talking about. So guys, remember the best stories are true, and you come here every week because I give them to you that's going to be the show for tonight guys that's steve i'm dj this has been the show go check these guys out we'll see you on the next one bye